nine, chapter two of Progress and Poverty by Henry George. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book nine, chapter two. Of the effect upon distribution and thence upon production. But great as they thus appear, the advantages of a transference of all public burdens to a tax upon the value of land cannot be fully appreciated until we consider the effect upon the distribution of wealth. Tracing out the cause of the unequal distribution of wealth which appears in all civilized countries, with a constant tendency to greater and greater inequality as material progress goes on, we have found it in the fact that, as civilization advances, the ownership of land, now in private hands, gives a greater and greater power of appropriating the wealth produced by labor and capital. Thus, to relieve labor and capital from all taxation, direct and indirect, and to throw the burden upon rent, would be, as far as it went, to counteract this tendency to inequality, and, if it went so far as to take in taxation the whole of rent, the cause of inequality would be totally destroyed. Rent, instead of causing inequality, as now, would then promote equality. Labor and capital would then receive the whole produce, minus that portion taken by the state in the taxation of land values, which, being applied to public purposes, would be equally distributed in public benefits. That is to say, the wealth produced in every community would be divided into two portions. One part would be distributed in wages and interest between individual producers, according to the part each had taken in the work of production. The other part would go to the community as a whole, to be distributed in public benefits to all its members. In this all would share equally, the weak with the strong, young children and decrepit old men, the maimed, the halt and the blind, as well as the vigorous. And justly so, for while one part represents the result of individual effort in production, the other represents the increased power with which the community as a whole aids the individual. Thus, as material progress tends to increase rent, were rent taken by the community for common purposes, the very cause which now tends to produce inequality as material progress goes on, would then tend to produce greater and greater equality. Fully to understand this effect, let us revert to principles previously worked out. We have seen that wages and interest must everywhere be fixed by the rent line or margin of cultivation, that is to say, by the reward which labor and capital can secure on land for which no rent is paid, that the aggregate amount of wealth which the aggregate of labor and capital employed in production will receive will be the amount of wealth produced, or rather, when we consider taxes, the net amount, minus what is taken as rent. We have seen that with material progress, as it is at present going on, there is a twofold tendency to the advance of rent. Both are to the increase of the proportion of the wealth produced which goes as rent, and to the decrease of the proportion which goes as wages and interest. But the first or natural tendency, which results from the laws of social development, is to the increase of rent as a quantity, without the reduction of wages and interest as quantities, or even with their quantitative increase. The other tendency, which results from the unnatural appropriation of land to private ownership, is to the increase of rent as a quantity by the reduction of wages and interest as quantities. Now, it is evident that to take rent and taxation for public purposes, which virtually abolishes private ownership in land, would be to destroy the tendency to an absolute decrease in wages and interest by destroying the speculative monopolization of land and the speculative increase in rent. It would be very largely to increase wages and interest by throwing open natural opportunities now monopolized and reducing the price of land. Labor and capital would thus not merely gain what is now taken from them in taxation, but would gain by the positive decline in rent caused by the decrease in speculative land values. A new equilibrium would be established, at which the common rate of wages and interest would be much higher than now. But this new equilibrium established, further advances in productive power, and the tendency in this direction would be greatly accelerated, would result in still increasing rent, 
not at the expense of wages and interest, but by new gains in production, which, as rent would be taken by the community for public uses, would accrue to the advantage of every member of the community. Thus, as material progress went on, the condition of the masses would constantly improve. Not merely one class would become richer, but all would become richer. Not merely one class would have more of the necessaries, conveniences, and elegancies of life, but all would have more. For the increasing power of production, which comes with increasing population, with every new discovery in the productive arts, with every labor-saving invention, with every extension and facilitation of exchanges, could be monopolized by none. That part of the benefit which did not go directly to increase the reward of labor and capital would go to the state, that is to say, to the whole community. With all the enormous advantages, material and mental, of a dense population, would be united the freedom and equality that can now be found only in new and sparsely settled districts. And then, consider how equalization in the distribution of wealth would react upon production, everywhere preventing waste, everywhere increasing power. If it were possible to express in figures the direct pecuniary loss which society suffers from the social maladjustments which condemn large classes to poverty and vice, the estimate would be appalling. England maintains over a million paupers on official charity. The city of New York alone spends over seven million dollars a year in a similar way. But what is spent from public funds, what is spent by charitable societies, and what is spent in individual charity would, if aggregated, be but the first and smallest item in the account. The potential earnings of the labor thus going to waste, the cost of the reckless, improvident, and idle habits thus generated, the pecuniary loss, to consider nothing more, suggested by the appalling statistics of mortality, and especially infant mortality, among the poorer classes, the waste indicated by the gin palaces or low groggeries which increase as poverty deepens, the damage done by the vermin of society that are bred of poverty and destitution, the thieves, prostitutes, beggars and tramps, the cost of guarding society against them are all items in the sum which the present unjust and unequal distribution of wealth takes from the aggregate which, with present means of production, society might enjoy. Nor yet shall we have completed the account. The ignorance and vice, the recklessness and immorality engendered by the inequality in the distribution of wealth show themselves in the imbecility and corruption of government and the waste of public revenues, and the still greater waste involved in the ignorant and corrupt abuse of public powers and functions, are their legitimate consequences. But the increase in wages, and the opening of new avenues of employment which would result from the appropriation of rent to public purposes, would not merely stop these wastes and relieve society of these enormous losses. New power would be added to labor. It is but a truism that labor is most productive where its wages are largest. Poorly paid labor is inefficient labor the world over. What is remarked between the efficiency of labor in the agricultural districts of England where different rates of wages prevail, what Brassy noticed is between the work done by his better paid English navvies and that done by the worse paid labor of the continent, what was evident in the United States as between slave labor and free labor, what is seen by the astonishing number of mechanics or servants required in India or China to get anything done, is universally true. The efficiency of labor always increases with the habitual wages of labor, for high wages mean increased self-respect, intelligence, hope, and energy. Man is not a machine that will do so much and no more. He is not an animal whose powers may reach thus far and no further. It is mind, not muscle, which is the great agent of production. The physical power evolved in the human frame is one of the weakest of forces, but for the human intelligence the resistless currents of nature flow, and matter becomes plastic to the human will. To increase the comforts and leisure and independence of the masses is to increase their intelligence. It is to bring the brain to the aid of the hand. It is to engage in the common work of life the faculty which measures the animalcule and traces the orbits of the stars. 
Who can say to what infinite powers the wealth-producing capacity of labor may not be raised by social adjustments which will give to the producers of wealth their fair proportion of its advantages and enjoyments? With present processes the gain would be simply incalculable, but just as wages are high, so do the invention and utilization of improved processes and machinery go on with greater rapidity and ease. That the wheat crops of southern Russia are still reaped with the scythe and beaten out with the flail is simply because wages are there so low. American invention, American aptitude for labor-saving processes and machinery are the result of the comparatively high wages that have prevailed in the United States. Had our producers been condemned to the low reward of the Egyptian fellow or Chinese coolie, we would be drawing water by hand and transporting goods on the shoulders of men. The increase in the reward of labor and capital would still further stimulate invention and hasten the adoption of improved processes, and these would truly appear, what in themselves they really are, an unmixed good. The injurious effects of labor-saving machinery upon the working classes, that are now so often apparent, and that, in spite of all argument, make so many people regard machinery as an evil instead of a blessing, would disappear. Every new power engaged in the service of man would improve the condition of all. And from the general intelligence and mental activity springing from this general improvement of condition would come new developments of power of which we as yet cannot dream. But I shall not deny, and do not wish to lose sight of the fact, that while thus preventing waste and thus adding to the efficiency of labor, the equalization in the distribution of wealth that would result from the simple plan of taxation that I propose must lessen the intensity with which wealth is pursued. It seems to me that in a condition of society in which no one need fear poverty, no one would desire great wealth. At least no one would take the trouble to strive and to strain for it as men do now. For, certainly, the spectacle of men who have only a few years to live, slaving away their time for the sake of dying rich, is in itself so unnatural and absurd that in a state of society where the abolition of the fear of want had dissipated the envious admiration with which the masses of men now regard the possession of great riches, whoever would toil to acquire more than he cared to use would be looked upon as we would now look on a man who would thatch his head with half a dozen hats, or walk around in the hot sun with an overcoat on. When every one is sure of being able to get enough, no one will care to make a pack-horse of himself. And though this incentive to production be withdrawn, can we not spare it? Whatever may have been its office in an earlier stage of development, it is not needed now. The dangers that menace our civilization do not come from the weakness of the springs of production. What it suffers from, and what, if a remedy be not applied, it must die from, is unequal distribution. Nor would the removal of this incentive, regarded only from the standpoint of production, be an unmixed loss. For that the aggregate of production is greatly reduced by the greed with which riches are pursued is one of the most obtrusive facts of modern society. While were this insane desire to get rich at any cost lessened, mental activities now devoted to scraping together riches would be translated into far higher spheres of usefulness. End of Book 9, Chapter 2 Recording by Tim Macarios idiophilus.wordpress.com Book 9, Chapter 3 of Progress and Poverty by Henry George This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 9, Chapter 3 of the effect upon individuals and classes. When it is first proposed to put all taxes upon the value of land, and thus confiscate rent, all landholders are likely to take the alarm, and there will not be wanting appeals to the fears of small farm and homestead owners, who will be told that this is a proposition to rob them of their hard-earned property. But a moment's reflection will show that this proposition should commend itself to all whose interests as landholders do not largely exceed their interests as labourers or capitalists, or both. 
and further consideration will show that though the large landholders may lose relatively, yet even in their case there will be an absolute gain. For the increase in production will be so great that labor and capital will gain very much more than will be lost to private land ownership, while in these gains, and in the greater ones involved in a more healthy social condition, the whole community, including the landowners themselves, will share. In a preceding chapter I have gone over the question of what is due to the present landholders, and have shown that they have no claim to compensation. But there is still another ground on which we may dismiss all idea of compensation. They will not really be injured. It is manifest, of course, that the change I propose will greatly benefit all those who live by wages, whether of hand or of head, laborers, operatives, mechanics, clerks, professional men of all sorts. It is manifest also that it will benefit all those who live partly by wages and partly by the earnings of their capital, storekeepers, merchants, manufacturers, employing or undertaking producers and exchangers of all sorts, from the peddler or drayman to the railroad or steamship owner, and it is likewise manifest that it will increase the incomes of those whose incomes are drawn from the earnings of capital, or from investments other than in land, save perhaps the holders of government bonds or other securities bearing fixed rates of interest, which will probably depreciate in selling value, owing to the rise in the general rate of interest, though the income from them will remain the same. Take now the case of the homestead owner the mechanic, storekeeper, or professional man who has secured himself a house and lot where he lives, and which he contemplates with satisfaction as a place from which his family cannot be ejected in case of his death. He will not be injured. On the contrary, he will be the gainer. The selling value of his lot will diminish. Theoretically, it will entirely disappear. But its usefulness to him will not disappear. It will serve his purpose as well as ever, while, as the value of all other lots will diminish or disappear in the same ratio, he retains the same security of always having a lot that he had before. That is to say, he is a loser only as the man who has bought himself a pair of boots may be said to be a loser by a subsequent fall in the price of boots. His boots will be just as useful to him, and the next pair of boots he can get cheaper. So, to the homestead owner, his lot will be as useful and should he look forward to getting a larger lot, or having his children, as they grow up, get homesteads of their own, he will, even in the matter of lots, be the gainer. And in the present, other things considered, he will be much the gainer. For though he will have more taxes to pay upon his land, he will be released from taxes upon his house and improvements, upon his furniture and personal property, upon all that he and his family eat, drink, and wear, while his earnings will be largely increased by the rise of wages, the constant employment, and the increased briskness of trade. His only loss will be if he wants to sell his lot without getting another, and this will be a small loss compared with the great gain. And so with the farmer. I speak not now of the farmers who never touch the handles of a plough, who cultivate thousands of acres and enjoy incomes like those of the rich southern planters before the war but of the working farmers who constitute such a large class in the United States, men who own small farms, which they cultivate with the aid of their boys, and perhaps some hired help, and who in Europe would be called peasant proprietors. Paradoxical as it may appear to these men until they understand the full bearings of the proposition, of all classes above that of the mere labourer they have most to gain by placing all taxes upon the value of land. That they do not now get as good a living as their hard work ought to give them, they generally feel, though they may not be able to trace the cause. The fact is that taxation, as now levied, falls on them with peculiar severity. They are taxed on all their improvements, houses, barns, fences, crops, stock. The personal property which they have cannot be as readily concealed or undervalued as can the more valuable kinds which are concentrated in the cities. They are not only taxed on personal property and improvements, which the owners of unused land escape, but their land is generally taxed at a higher rate than land held on speculation, simply because it is improved. But further than this, all taxes imposed on commodities, 
and especially the taxes which, like our protective duties, are imposed with a view of raising the prices of commodities, fall on the farmer without mitigation. For in a country like the United States, which exports agricultural produce, the farmer cannot be protected. Whoever gains, he must lose. Some years ago, the Free Trade League of New York published a broadside containing cuts of various articles of necessity marked with the duties imposed by the tariff, and which read something in this wise. The farmer rises in the morning and draws on his pantaloons taxed forty per cent, and his boots taxed thirty per cent, striking a light with a match taxed two hundred per cent, and so on, following him through the day and through life, until, killed by taxation, he is lowered into the grave with a rope taxed forty-five per cent. This is but a graphic illustration of the manner in which such taxes ultimately fall. The farmer would be a great gainer by the substitution of a single tax upon the value of land for all these taxes, for the taxation of land values would fall with greatest weight not upon the agricultural districts where land values are comparatively small, but upon the towns and cities where land values are high, whereas taxes upon personal property and improvements fall as heavily in the country as in the city and in sparsely settled districts there would be hardly any taxes at all for the farmer to pay. For taxes, being levied upon the value of the bare land, would fall as heavily upon unimproved as upon improved land. Acre for acre, the improved and cultivated farm, with its buildings, fences, orchard, crops and stock, could be taxed no more than unused land of equal quality. The result would be that speculative values would be kept down, and that cultivated and improved farms would have no taxes to pay until the country around them had been well settled. In fact, paradoxical as it may at first seem to them, the effect of putting all taxation upon the value of land would be to relieve the harder-working farmers of all taxation. But the great gain of the working farmer can be seen only when the effect upon the distribution of population is considered. The destruction of speculative land values would tend to diffuse population where it is too dense and to concentrate it where it is too sparse, to substitute for the tenement house homes surrounded by gardens, and fully to settle agricultural districts before people were driven far from neighbours to look for land. The people of the cities would thus get more of the pure air and sunshine of the country, the people of the country more of the economies and social life of the city. If, as is doubtless the case, the application of machinery tends to large fields, agricultural population will assume the primitive form and cluster in villages. The life of the average farmer is now unnecessarily dreary. He is not only compelled to work early and late, but he is cut off by the sparseness of population from the conveniences and amusements, the educational facilities, and the social and intellectual opportunities that come with the closer contact of man with man. He would be far better off in all these respects, and his labour would be far more productive, if he and those around him held no more land than they wanted to use. Footnote Besides the enormous increase in the productive power of labour which would result from the better distribution of population, there would be also a similar economy in the productive power of land. The concentration of population in cities fed by the exhaustive cultivation of large, sparsely populated areas results in a literal draining into the sea of the elements of fertility. How enormous this waste is may be seen from the calculations that have been made as to the sewage of our cities, and its practical result is to be seen in the diminishing productiveness of agriculture in large sections. In a great part of the United States we are steadily exhausting our lands. End of footnote. While his children, as they grew up, would neither be so impelled to seek the excitement of a city, nor would they be driven so far away to seek farms of their own. Their means of living would be in their own hands and at home. In short, the working farmer is both a labourer and a capitalist, as well as a landowner, and it is by his labour and capital that his living is made. His loss would be nominal, his gain would be real and great. In varying degrees this is true of all landholders. 
Many landholders are laborers of one sort or another, and it would be hard to find a landowner not a laborer who is not also a capitalist, while the general rule is that the larger the landowner the greater the capitalist. So true is this that in common thought the characters are confounded. Thus to put all taxes on the value of land, while it would be largely to reduce all great fortunes, would in no case leave the rich man penniless. The Duke of Westminster, who owns a considerable part of the site of London, is probably the richest landowner in the world. To take all his ground rents by taxation would largely reduce his enormous income, but would still leave him his buildings and all the income from them, and doubtless much personal property in various other shapes. He would still have all he could by any possibility enjoy, and a much better state of society in which to enjoy it. So would the Astors of New York remain very rich. And so I think it will be seen throughout. This measure would make no one poorer but such as could be made a great deal poorer without being really hurt. It would cut down great fortunes, but it would impoverish no one. Wealth would not only be enormously increased, it would be equally distributed. I do not mean that each individual would get the same amount of wealth. That would not be equal distribution, so long as different individuals have different powers and different desires. But I mean that wealth would be distributed in accordance with the degree in which the industry, skill, knowledge or prudence of each contributed to the common stock. The great cause which concentrates wealth in the hands of those who do not produce, and takes it from the hands of those who do, would be gone. The inequalities that continued to exist would be those of nature, not the artificial inequalities produced by the denial of natural law. The non-producer would no longer roll in luxury while the producer got but the barest necessities of animal existence. The monopoly of the land gone, there need be no fear of large fortunes. For then the riches of any individual must consist of wealth, properly so called, of wealth which is the product of labour and which constantly tends to dissipation, for national debts, I imagine, would not long survive the abolition of the system from which they spring. All fear of great fortunes might be dismissed, for when every one gets what he fairly earns, no one can get more than he fairly earns. How many men are there who fairly earn a million dollars? End of Book 9, Chapter 3 Recording by Tim Macarios Idiophilus.wordpress.com Book Nine, Chapter Four of Progress and Poverty by Henry George. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Nine, Chapter Four Of the Changes That Would Be Wrought in Social Organization and Social Life. We are dealing only with general principles. There are some matters of detail such as those arising from the division of revenues between local and general governments, which upon application of these principles would come up, but these it is not necessary here to discuss. When once principles are settled, details will be readily adjusted. Nor without too much elaboration is it possible to notice all the changes which would be wrought, or would become possible, by a change which would readjust the very foundation of society, but to some main features let me call attention. Noticeable among these is the great simplicity which would become possible in government. To collect taxes, to prevent and punish evasions, to check and counter-check revenues drawn from so many distinct sources, now make up probably three-fourths, perhaps seven-eighths of the business of government, outside of the preservation of order, the maintenance of the military arm, and the administration of justice. An immense and complicated network of governmental machinery would thus be dispensed with. In the administration of justice there would be a like saving of strain. Much of the civil business of our courts arises from disputes as to ownership of land. These would cease when the state was virtually acknowledged as the sole owner of land, and all occupiers became practically rent-paying tenants. 
The growth of morality consequent upon the cessation of want would tend to a like diminution in other civil business of the courts, which could be hastened by the adoption of the common-sense proposition of Bentham to abolish all laws for the collection of debts and the enforcement of private contracts. The rise of wages, the opening of opportunities for all to make an easy and comfortable living, would at once lessen and would soon eliminate from society the thieves, swindlers, and other classes of criminals who spring from the unequal distribution of wealth. Thus the administration of the criminal law, with all its paraphernalia of policemen, detectives, prisons, and penitentiaries, would, like the administration of the civil law, cease to make such a drain upon the vital force and attention of society. We should get rid not only of many judges, bailiffs, clerks, and prison-keepers, but of the great host of lawyers who are now maintained at the expense of producers, and talent now wasted in legal subtleties would be turned to higher pursuits. The legislative, judicial, and executive functions of government would in this way be vastly simplified. Nor can I think that the public debts and the standing armies, which are historically the outgrowth of the change from feudal to allodial tenures, would long remain after the reversion to the old idea that the land of a country is the common right of the people of the country. The former could readily be paid off by a tax that would not lessen the wages of labour nor check production, and the latter, the growth of intelligence and independence among the masses, aided perhaps by the progress of invention, which is revolutionizing the military art, must soon cause to disappear. Society would thus approach the ideal of Jeffersonian democracy, the promised land of Herbert Spencer, the abolition of government. But of government only as a directing and repressive power, it would at the same time and in the same degree become possible for it to realize the dream of socialism. All this simplification and abrogation of the present functions of government would make possible the assumption of certain other functions which are now pressing for recognition. Government could take upon itself the transmission of messages by telegraph as well as by mail, of building and operating railroads as well as of opening and maintaining common roads. With present functions so simplified and reduced, functions such as these could be assumed without danger or strain, and would be under the supervision of public attention, which is now distracted. There would be a great and increasing surplus revenue from the taxation of land values, for material progress, which would go on with greatly accelerated rapidity, would tend constantly to increase rent. This revenue arising from the common property could be applied to the common benefit, as were the revenues of Sparta. We might not establish public tables, they would be unnecessary, but we could establish public baths, museums, libraries, gardens, lecture rooms, music and dancing halls, theatres, universities, technical schools, shooting galleries, playgrounds, gymnasiums, etc. Heat, light, and motive power, as well as water, might be conducted through our streets at public expense. Our roads be lined with fruit trees, discoverers and inventors rewarded, scientific investigations supported, and in a thousand ways the public revenues made to foster efforts for the public benefit. We should reach the ideal of the socialist, but not through government repression. Government would change its character, and would become the administration of a great cooperative society. It would become merely the agency by which the common property was administered for the common benefit. Does this seem impracticable? Consider for a moment the vast changes that would be wrought in social life by a change which would assure to labour its full reward, which would banish want and the fear of want and give to the humblest freedom to develop in natural symmetry. In thinking of the possibilities of social organization, we are apt to assume that greed is the strongest of human motives, and that systems of administration can be safely based only upon the idea that the fear of punishment is necessary to keep men honest, that selfish interests are always stronger than general interests. Nothing could be further from the truth. From whence springs this lust for gain, to gratify which men tread everything pure and noble under their feet, 
to which they sacrifice all the higher possibilities of life, which converts civility into a hollow pretense, patriotism into a sham, and religion into hypocrisy, which makes so much of civilized existence in Ishmaelitish warfare, of which the weapons are cunning and fraud. Does it not spring from the existence of want? Carlyle somewhere says that poverty is the hell of which the modern Englishman is most afraid. And he is right. Poverty is the open-mouthed, relentless hell which yawns beneath civilized society. And it is hell enough. The Vedas declare no truer thing than when the wise Crow Bushanda tells the eagle-bearer of Vishnu that the keenest pain is in poverty. For poverty is not merely deprivation. It means shame, degradation, the searing of the most sensitive parts of our moral and mental nature as with hot irons, the denial of the strongest impulses and the sweetest affections, the wrenching of the most vital nerves. You love your wife, you love your children, but would it not be easier to see them die than to see them reduced to the pinch of want in which large classes in every highly civilized community live? The strongest of animal passions is that with which we cling to life, but it is an everyday occurrence in civilized societies for men to put poison to their mouths or pistols to their heads from fear of poverty, and for one who does this there are probably a hundred who have the desire, but are restrained by instinctive shrinking, by religious considerations, or by family ties. From this hell of poverty it is but natural that men should make every effort to escape. With the impulse to self-preservation and self-gratification combine nobler feelings, and love as well as fear urges in the struggle. Many a man does a mean thing, a dishonest thing, a greedy and grasping and unjust thing, in the effort to place above want, or the fear of want, mother or wife or children. And out of this condition of things arises a public opinion which enlists, as an impelling power in the struggle to grasp and to keep, one of the strongest, perhaps with many men the very strongest, springs of human action. The desire for approbation, the feeling that urges us to win the respect, admiration or sympathy of our fellows, is instinctive and universal. Distorted sometimes into the most abnormal manifestations, it may yet be everywhere perceived. It is potent with the veriest savage, as with the most highly cultivated member of the most polished society. It shows itself with the first gleam of intelligence, and persists to the last breath. It triumphs over the love of ease, over the sense of pain, over the dread of death. It dictates the most trivial and the most important actions. The child just beginning to toddle or to talk will make new efforts as its cunning little tricks excite attention and laughter. The dying master of the world gathers his robes around him, that he may pass away as becomes a king. Chinese mothers will deform their daughters' feet by cruel stocks. European women will sacrifice their own comfort and the comfort of their families to similar dictates of fashion. The Polynesian, that he may excite admiration by his beautiful tattoo, will hold himself still while his flesh is torn by shark's teeth. The North American Indian, tied to the stake, will bear the most fiendish tortures without a moan, and, that he may be respected and admired as a great brave, will taunt his tormentors to new cruelties. It is this that leads the forlorn hope. It is this that trims the lamp of the pale student. It is this that impels men to strive, to strain, to toil, and to die. It is this that raised the pyramids, and that fired the Ephesian dome. Now men admire what they desire. How sweet to the storm-stricken seems the safe harbour, food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, warmth to the shivering, rest to the weary, power to the weak, knowledge to him in whom the intellectual yearnings of the soul have been aroused. And thus the sting of want and the fear of want make men admire above all things the possession of riches, and to become wealthy is to become respected and admired and influential. Get money, honestly if you can, but at any rate get money. This is the lesson that society is daily and hourly dinning in the ears of its members. Men instinctively admire virtue and truth, 
but the sting of want and the fear of want make them even more strongly admire the rich and sympathize with the fortunate. It is well to be honest and just, and men will commend it. But he who by fraud and injustice gets him a million dollars will have more respect and admiration and influence, more eye service and lip service, if not heart service, than he who refuses it. The one may have his reward in the future. He may know that his name is writ in the book of life, and that for him is the white robe and the palm branch of the victor against temptation. But the other has his reward in the present. His name is writ in the list of our substantial citizens. He has the courtship of men and the flattery of women. The best pew in the church and the personal regard of the eloquent clergyman who in the name of Christ preaches the gospel of dives and tones down into a meaningless flower of eastern speech the stern metaphor of the camel and the needle's eye. He may be a patron of arts, a Mycenaeus to men of letters, may profit by the converse of the intelligent, and be polished by the attrition of the refined. His arms may feed the poor, and help the struggling, and bring sunshine into desolate places, and noble public institutions commemorate, after he is gone, his name and his fame. It is not in the guise of a hideous monster with horns and tail that Satan tempts the children of men, but as an angel of light. His promises are not alone of the kingdoms of the world, but of mental and moral principalities and powers. He appeals not only to the animal appetites, but to the cravings that stir in man because he is more than an animal. Take the case of those miserable men with muckrakes, who are to be seen in every community as plainly as Bunyan saw their type in his vision, who, long after they have accumulated wealth enough to satisfy every desire, go on working, scheming, striving to add riches to riches. It was the desire to be something, nay, in many cases, the desire to do noble and generous deeds, that started them on a career of money-getting. And what compels them to it long after every possible need is satisfied, what urges them still with unsatisfied and ravenous greed, is not merely the force of tyrannous habit, but the subtler gratifications which the possession of riches gives, the sense of power and influence, the sense of being looked up to and respected, the sense that their wealth not merely raises them above want, but makes them men of mark in the community in which they live. It is this that makes the rich man so loath to part with his money, so anxious to get more. Against temptations that thus appeal to the strongest impulses of our nature, the sanctions of law and the precepts of religion can effect but little, and the wonder is not that men are so self-seeking, but that they are not much more so. That under present circumstances men are not more grasping, more unfaithful, more selfish than they are, proves the goodness and fruitfulness of human nature, the ceaseless flow of the perennial fountains from which its moral qualities are fed. All of us have mothers, most of us have children, and so faith and purity and unselfishness can never be utterly banished from the world, howsoever bad be social adjustments. But whatever is potent for evil may be made potent for good. The change I have proposed would destroy the conditions that distort impulses in themselves beneficent, and would transmute the forces which now tend to disintegrate society into forces which would tend to unite and purify it. Give labor a free field and its full earnings. Take for the benefit of the whole community that fund which the growth of the community creates, and want and the fear of want would be gone. The springs of production would be set free, and the enormous increase of wealth would give the poorest ample comfort. Men would no more worry about finding employment than they worry about finding air to breathe. They need have no more care about physical necessities than do the lilies of the field. The progress of science, the march of invention, the diffusion of knowledge would bring their benefits to all. With this abolition of want and the fear of want, the admiration of riches would decay, and men would seek the respect and approbation of their fellows in other modes than by the acquisition and display of wealth. 
In this way there would be brought to the management of public affairs and the administration of common funds the skill, the attention, the fidelity, and integrity that can now be secured only for private interests, and a railroad or gas works might be operated on public account, not only more economically and efficiently than as at present under joint stock management, but as economically and efficiently as would be possible under a single ownership. The prize of the Olympian Games, that called forth the most strenuous exertions of all Greece, was but a wreath of wild olive. For a bit of ribbon men have over and over again performed services no money could have bought. Short-sighted is the philosophy which counts on selfishness as the master motive of human action. It is blind to facts of which the world is full. It sees not the present, and reads not the past aright. If you would move men to action, to what shall you appeal? Not to their pockets, but to their patriotism. Not to selfishness, but to sympathy. Self-interest is, as it were, a mechanical force, potent, it is true, capable of large and wide results. But there is in human nature what may be likened to a chemical force, which melts and fuses and overwhelms, to which nothing seems impossible. All that a man hath will he give for his life. That is self-interest. But in loyalty to higher impulses men will give even life. It is not selfishness that enriches the annals of every people with heroes and saints. It is not selfishness that on every page of the world's history bursts out in sudden splendor of noble deeds or sheds the soft radiance of benignant lives. It was not selfishness that turned Gautama's back to his royal home, or bade the maid of Orléans lift the sword from the altar, that held the three hundred in the pass of Thermopylae, or gathered into Winkelried's bosom the sheaf of spears, that chained Vincent de Paul to the bench of the galley, or brought little starving children during the Indian famine tottering to the relief stations with yet weaker starvelings in their arms. Call it religion, patriotism, sympathy, the enthusiasm for humanity, or the love of God. Give it what name you will. There is yet a force which overcomes and drives out selfishness, a force which is the electricity of the moral universe, a force beside which all others are weak. Everywhere that men have lived it has shown its power, and today as ever the world is full of it. To be pitied is the man who has never seen and never felt it. Look around. Among common men and women, amid the care and the struggle of daily life, in the jar of the noisy street and amid the squalor where want hides, every here and there is the darkness lighted with the tremulous play of its lambent flames. He who has not seen it has walked with shut eyes. He who looks may see, as says Plutarch, that the soul has a principle of kindness in itself, and is born to love as well as to perceive, think, or remember. And this force of forces, that now goes to waste or assumes perverted forms, we may use for the strengthening and building up and ennobling of society, if we but will, just as we now use physical forces that once seemed but powers of destruction. All we have to do is but to give it freedom and scope. The wrong that produces inequality, the wrong that in the midst of abundance tortures men with want or harries them with the fear of want, that stunts them physically, degrades them intellectually, and distorts them morally, is what alone prevents harmonious social development. For all that is from the gods is full of providence. We are made for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of the upper and lower teeth. There are people into whose heads it never enters to conceive of any better state of society than that which now exists, who imagine that the idea that there could be a state of society in which greed would be banished, prisons stand empty, individual interests be subordinated to general interests, and no one seek to rob or to oppress his neighbour, is but the dream of impracticable dreamers, for whom these practical level-headed men, who pride themselves on recognising facts as they are, have a hearty contempt. But such men, though some of them write books, and some of them occupy the chairs of universities, and some of them stand in pulpits, do not think. 
if they were accustomed to dine in such eating-houses as are to be found in the lower quarters of London and Paris, where the knives and forks are chained to the table, they would deem it the natural, ineradicable disposition of man to carry off the knife and fork with which he has eaten. Take a company of well-bred men and women dining together. There is no struggling for food, no attempt on the part of any one to get more than his neighbour, no attempt to gorge or to carry off. On the contrary, each one is anxious to help his neighbour before he partakes himself, to offer to others the best rather than pick it out for himself. And should any one show the slightest disposition to prefer the gratification of his own appetite to that of the others, or in any way to act the pig or pilferer, the swift and heavy penalty of social contempt and ostracism would show how such conduct is reprobated by common opinion. All this is so common as to excite no remark, as to seem the natural state of things. Yet it is no more natural that men should not be greedy of food than that they should not be greedy of wealth. They are greedy of food when they are not assured that there will be a fair and equitable distribution which will give each enough. But when these conditions are assured, they cease to be greedy of food. And so in society, as at present constituted, men are greedy of wealth because the conditions of distribution are so unjust that instead of each being sure of enough, many are certain to be condemned to want. It is the devil catch the hindmost of present social adjustments that causes the race and scramble for wealth, in which all considerations of justice, mercy, religion and sentiment are trampled underfoot in which men forget their own souls and struggle to the very verge of the grave for what they cannot take beyond but an equitable distribution of wealth that would exempt all from the fear of want would destroy the greed of wealth just as in polite society the greed of food has been destroyed on the crowded steamers of the early california lines there was often a marked difference between the manners of the steerage and the cabin which illustrates this principle of human nature an abundance of food was provided for the steerage as for the cabin, but in the former there were no regulations which ensured efficient service, and the meals became a scramble. In the cabin, on the contrary, where each was allotted his place, and there was no fear that every one would not get enough, there was no such scrambling and waste as were witnessed in the steerage. The difference was not in the character of the people, but simply in this fact. The cabin passenger transferred to the steerage would participate in the greedy rush, and the steerage passenger transferred to the cabin would at once become decorous and polite. The same difference would show itself in society in general were the present unjust distribution of wealth replaced by a just distribution. Consider this existing fact of a cultivated and refined society, in which all the coarser passions are held in check, not by force, not by law, but by common opinion and the mutual desire of pleasing. If this is possible for a part of a community, it is possible for a whole community. There are states of society in which every one has to go armed, in which every one has to hold himself in readiness to defend person and property with the strong hand. If we have progressed beyond that, we may progress still further. But it may be said, to banish want and the fear of want would be to destroy the stimulus to exertion. Men would become simply idlers, and such a happy state of general comfort and content would be the death of progress. This is the old slaveholder's argument, that men can be driven to labour only with the lash. Nothing is more untrue. Want might be banished, but desire would remain. Man is the unsatisfied animal. He has but begun to explore, and the universe lies before him. Each step that he takes opens new vistas and kindles new desires. He is the constructive animal. He builds, he improves, he invents, and puts together, and the greater the thing he does, the greater the thing he wants to do. He is more than an animal. Whatever be the intelligence that breathes through nature, it is in that likeness that man is made. The steamship, driven by her throbbing engines through the sea, is in kind, though not in degree, as much a creation as the whale that swims beneath. The telescope and the microscope, what are they but added eyes which man has made for himself? The soft webs and fair colours in which our women array themselves, 
Do they not answer to the plumage that nature gives the bird? Man must be doing something, or fancy that he is doing something, for in him throbs the creative impulse. The mere basker in the sunshine is not a natural, but an abnormal man. As soon as a child can command its muscles, it will begin to make mud pies or dress a doll. Its play is but the imitation of the work of its elders. Its very destructiveness arises from the desire to be doing something, from the satisfaction of seeing itself accomplish something. There is no such thing as the pursuit of pleasure for the sake of pleasure. Our very amusements amuse only as they are or simulate the learning or the doing of something. The moment they cease to appeal either to our inquisitive or to our constructive powers, they cease to amuse. It will spoil the interest of the novel reader to be told just how the story will end. It is only the chance and the skill involved in the game that enable the card player to kill time by shuffling bits of pasteboard. The luxurious frivolities of Versailles were possible to human beings only because the king thought he was governing a kingdom and the courtiers were in pursuit of fresh honours and new pensions. People who lead what are called lives of fashion and pleasure must have some other object in view, or they would die of ennui. They support it only because they imagine that they are gaining position, making friends, or improving the chances of their children. Shut a man up and deny him employment, and he must either die or go mad. It is not labour in itself that is repugnant to man. It is not the natural necessity for exertion which is a curse. It is only labour which produces nothing, exertion of which he cannot see the results. To toil day after day, and yet get but the necessaries of life, this is indeed hard. It is like the infernal punishment of compelling a man to pump lest he be drowned, or to trudge on a treadmill lest he be crushed. But released from this necessity, men would but work the harder and the better, for then they would work as their inclinations led them. Then would they seem to be really doing something for themselves or for others. Was Humboldt's life an idle one? Did Franklin find no occupation when he retired from the printing business with enough to live on? Is Herbert Spencer a laggard? Did Michelangelo paint for board and clothes? The fact is that the work which improves the condition of mankind, the work which extends knowledge and increases power and enriches literature and elevates thought, is not done to secure a living. It is not the work of slaves, driven to their task either by the lash of a master or by animal necessities. It is the work of men who perform it for its own sake, and not that they may get more to eat or drink or wear or display. In a state of society where want was abolished, work of this sort would be enormously increased. I am inclined to think that the result of confiscating rent in the manner I have proposed would be to cause the organization of labor, wherever large capitals were used, to assume the cooperative form, since the more equal diffusion of wealth would unite capitalist and laborer in the same person. But whether this would be so or not is of little moment. The hard toil of routine labor would disappear. Wages would be too high and opportunities too great to compel any man to stint and starve the higher qualities of his nature, and in every avocation the brain would aid the hand. Work, even of the coarser kinds, would become a lightsome thing, and the tendency of modern production to subdivision would not involve monotony or the contraction of ability in the worker, but would be relieved by short hours, by change, by the alternation of intellectual with manual occupations. There would result not only the utilization of productive forces now going to waste, not only would our present knowledge, now so imperfectly applied, be fully used, but from the mobility of labor and the mental activity which would be generated, there would result advances in the methods of production that we now cannot imagine. For, greatest of all the enormous wastes which the present constitution of society involves, is that of mental power. How infinitesimal are the forces that concur to the advance of civilization as compared to the forces that lie latent? How few are the thinkers, the discoverers, the inventors, the organizers, as compared with the great mass of the people? Yet such men are born in plenty, 
it is the conditions that permit so few to develop. There are among men infinite diversities of aptitude and inclination, as there are such infinite diversities in physical structure that among a million there will not be two that cannot be told apart. But, both from observation and reflection, I am inclined to think that the differences of natural power are no greater than the differences of stature or of physical strength. Turn to the lives of great men, and see how easily they might never have been heard of. Had Caesar come of a proletarian family, had Napoleon entered the world a few years earlier, had Columbus gone to the church instead of going to sea, had Shakespeare been apprenticed to a cobbler or chimney-sweep, had Sir Isaac Newton been assigned by fate the education and the toil of an agricultural labourer, had Dr. Adam Smith been born in the coal hues, or Herbert Spencer forced to get his living as a factory operative, what would their talents have availed? But there would have been, as it will be said, other Caesars or Napoleons, Columbuses or Shakespeare's, Newtons, Smiths or Spencers. This is true, and it shows how prolific is our human nature. As the common worker is on need transformed into Queen Bee, so when circumstances favour his development, what might otherwise pass for a common man rises into a hero or leader, discoverer or teacher, sage or saint. So widely has the sower scattered the seed, so strong is the germinative force that bids it bud and blossom. But alas, for the stony ground and the birds and the tares, for one who attains his full stature, how many are stunted and deformed? The will within us is the ultimate fact of consciousness. Yet how little have the best of us in acquirements, in position, even in character, that may be credited entirely to ourselves, how much to the influences that have moulded us. Who is there, wise, learned, discreet, or strong, who might not, were he to trace the inner history of his life, turn, like the Stoic emperor, to give thanks to the gods, that by this one and that one here and there good examples have been set him, noble thoughts have reached him, and happy opportunities opened before him? Who is there who, with his eyes about him, has reached the meridian of life, who has not sometimes echoed the thought of the pious Englishman, as the criminal passed to the gallows, but for the grace of God there go I? How little does heredity count as compared with conditions? This one, we say, is the result of a thousand years of European progress, and that one of a thousand years of Chinese petrifaction. Yet, placed an infant in the heart of China, and but for the angle of the eye or the shade of the hair, the Caucasian would grow up as those around him, using the same speech, thinking the same thoughts, exhibiting the same tastes. Change Lady Ver de Ver in her cradle with an infant of the slums, and will the blood of a thousand earls give you a refined and cultured woman? To remove want and the fear of want, to give to all classes leisure and comfort and independence, the decencies and refinements of life, the opportunities of mental and moral development, would be like turning water into a desert. The sterile waste would clothe itself with verdure, and the barren places where life seemed banned would ere long be dappled with the shade of trees and musical with the song of birds. Talents now hidden, virtues unsuspected, would come forth to make human life richer, fuller, happier, nobler. For in these round men who are stuck into three-cornered holes, and three-cornered men who are jammed into round holes, in these men who are wasting their energies in the scramble to be rich, in these who in factories are turned into machines, or are chained by necessity to bench or plough, in these children who are growing up in squalor and vice and ignorance, are powers of the highest order, talents the most splendid. They need but the opportunity to bring them forth. Consider the possibilities of a state of society that gave that opportunity to all. Let imagination fill out the picture. Its colours grow too bright for words to paint. Consider the moral elevation, the intellectual activity, the social life. Consider how by a thousand actions and interactions the members of every community are linked together, and how in the present condition of things even the fortunate few who stand upon the apex of the social pyramid must suffer, though they know it not, from the want, ignorance, and degradation that are underneath. 
Consider these, and then say whether the change I propose would not be for the benefit of every one, even the greatest landholder. Would he not be safer of the future of his children in leaving them penniless in such a state of society than in leaving them the largest fortune in this? Did such a state of society anywhere exist, would he not buy entrance to it cheaply by giving up all his possessions? I have now traced to their source social weakness and disease. I have shown the remedy. I have covered every point and met every objection. But the problems that we have been considering, great as they are, pass into problems greater yet, into the grandest problems with which the human mind can grapple. I am about to ask the reader who has gone with me so far to go with me further, into still higher fields. But I ask him to remember that in the little space which remains of the limits to which this book must be confined, I cannot fully treat the questions which arise. I can but suggest some thoughts which may perhaps serve as hints for further thought. End of Book 9 Chapter 4 Recording by Tim Macarios idiophilus.wordpress.com Book 10, Chapter 1 of Progress and Poverty by Henry George This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 10 the law of human progress. What in me is dark illumine, what is low raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. Milton Book 10, Chapter 1 The Current Theory of Human Progress, Its Insufficiency if the conclusions at which we have arrived are correct, they will fall under a larger generalization. Let us, therefore, recommence our inquiry from a higher standpoint, whence we may survey a wider field. What is the law of human progress? This is a question which, were it not for what has gone before, I should hesitate to review in the brief space I can now devote to it, as it involves, directly or indirectly, some of the very highest problems with which the human mind can engage. But it is a question which naturally comes up. Are or are not the conclusions to which we have come consistent with the great law under which human development goes on? What is that law? We must find the answer to our question, for the current philosophy, though it clearly recognizes the existence of such a law, gives no more satisfactory account of it than the current political economy does of the persistence of want amid advancing wealth. Let us, as far as possible, keep to the firm ground of facts. Whether man was or was not gradually developed from an animal, it is not necessary to inquire. However intimate may be the connection between questions which relate to men as we know him and questions which relate to his genesis, it is only from the former upon the latter that light can be thrown. Inference cannot proceed from the unknown to the known. It is only from facts of which we are cognizant that we can infer what has preceded cognizance. However man may have originated, all we know of him is as man just as he is now to be found. There is no record or trace of him in any lower condition than that in which savages are still to be met. By whatever bridge he may have crossed the wide chasm which now separates him from the brutes, there remain of it no vestiges. Between the lowest savages of whom we know and the highest animals, there is an irreconcilable difference, a difference not merely of degree but of kind. Many of the characteristics, actions, and emotions of man are exhibited by the lower animals, but man, no matter how low in the scale of humanity, has never yet been found destitute of one thing of which no animal shows the slightest trace, a clearly recognizable but almost undefinable something, which gives him the power of improvement, which makes him the progressive animal. The beaver builds a dam, and the bird a nest, and the bee a cell, 
but while beavers' dams and birds' nests and bees' cells are always constructed on the same model, the house of the man passes from the rude hut of leaves and branches to the magnificent mansion replete with modern conveniences. The dog can to a certain extent connect cause and effect, and may be taught some tricks, but his capacity in these respects has not been a whit increased during all the ages he has been the associate of improving man, and the dog of civilization is not a whit more accomplished or intelligent than the dog of the wandering savage. We know of no animal that uses clothes, that cooks its food, that makes itself tools or weapons, that breeds other animals that it wishes to eat, or that has an articulate language. But men who do not do such things have never yet been found or heard of, except in fable. That is to say, man, wherever we know him, exhibits this power of supplementing what nature has done for him by what he does for himself. And, in fact, so inferior is the physical endowment of man that there is no part of the world, save perhaps some of the small islands of the Pacific, where without this faculty he could maintain an existence. Man everywhere and at all times exhibits this faculty. Everywhere and at all times of which we have knowledge he has made some use of it. But the degree in which this has been done greatly varies. Between the rude canoe and the steamship, between the boomerang and the repeating rifle, between the roughly carved wooden idol and the breathing marble of Grecian art, between savage knowledge and modern science, between the wild Indian and the white settler, between the hot and hot woman and the bell of polished society, there is an enormous difference. The varying degrees in which this faculty is used cannot be ascribed to differences in original capacity. The most highly improved peoples of the present day were savages within historic times, and we meet with the widest differences between peoples of the same stock. Nor can they be wholly ascribed to differences in physical environment. The cradles of learning and the arts are now in many cases tenanted by barbarians, and within a few years great cities rise on the hunting grounds of wild tribes. All these differences are evidently connected with social development. Beyond perhaps the veriest rudiments, it becomes possible for man to improve only as he lives with his fellows. All these improvements, therefore, in man's powers and conditions, we summarize in the term civilization. Men improve as they become civilized, or learn to cooperate in society. What is the law of this improvement? By what common principle can we explain the different stages of civilization at which different communities have arrived? In what consists essentially the progress of civilization, so that we may say of varying social adjustments, this favors it and that does not, or explain why an institution or condition which may at one time advance it may at another time retard it? The prevailing belief now is that the progress of civilization is a development or evolution, in the course of which man's powers are increased and his qualities improved by the operation of causes similar to those which are relied upon as explaining the genesis of species, viz. the survival of the fittest and the hereditary transmission of acquired qualities. That civilization is in evolution, that it is, in the language of Herbert Spencer, a progress from an indefinite, incoherent homogeneity to a definite, coherent heterogeneity, there is no doubt. But to say this is not to explain or identify the causes which forward or retard it. How far the sweeping generalizations of Spencer, which seek to account for all phenomena under terms of matter and force, may, properly understood, include all these causes, I am unable to say. But, as scientifically expounded, the development philosophy has either not yet definitely met this question, or has given birth, or rather coherency, to an opinion which does not accord with the facts. The vulgar explanation of progress is, I think, very much like the view naturally taken by the money-maker of the causes of the unequal distribution of wealth. His theory, if he has one, usually is that there is plenty of money to be made by those who have will and ability, and that it is ignorance or idleness or extravagance that makes the difference between the rich and the poor. And so the common explanation of differences of civilization is of differences in capacity. 
The civilized races are the superior races, and advance in civilization is according to this superiority, just as English victories were, in common English opinion, due to the natural superiority of Englishmen to frog-eating Frenchmen. And popular government, active invention, and greater average comfort are, or were until lately, in common American opinion, due to the greater smartness of the Yankee nation. Now, just as the politico-economic doctrines, which in the beginning of this inquiry we met and disproved, harmonize with the common opinion of men who see capitalists paying wages and competition reducing wages, just as the Malthusian theory harmonized with existing prejudices both of the rich and the poor, so does the explanation of progress as a gradual race improvement harmonize with the vulgar opinion which accounts by race differences for differences in civilization. It has given coherence and a scientific formula to opinions which already prevailed. Its wonderful spread since the time Darwin first startled the world with his origin of species has not been so much a conquest as an assimilation. The view which now dominates the world of thought is this, that the struggle for existence, just in proportion as it becomes intense, impels men to new efforts and inventions. That this improvement and capacity for improvement is fixed by hereditary transmission, and extended by the tendency of the best adapted individual, or most improved individual, to survive and propagate among individuals, and of the best adapted or most improved tribe, nation, or race, to survive in the struggle between social aggregates. On this theory, the differences between man and the animals, and differences in the relative progress of men, are now explained as confidently, and all but as generally, as a little while ago they were explained upon the theory of special creation and divine interposition. The practical outcome of this theory is in a sort of hopeful fatalism, of which current literature is full. Footnote in semi-scientific or popularized form this may perhaps be seen in best because frankest expression in the martyrdom of man by winwood reed a writer of singular vividness and power this book is in reality a history of progress or rather a monograph upon its causes and methods and will well repay perusal for its vivid pictures whatever may be thought of the capacity of the author for philosophic generalization the connection between subject and title may be seen by the conclusion i give to universal history a strange but true title the martyrdom of man in each generation the human race has been tortured that their children might profit by their woes our own prosperity is founded on the agonies of the past is it therefore unjust that we also should suffer for the benefit of those who are to come End of footnote. In this view, progress is the result of forces which work slowly, steadily, and remorselessly for the elevation of man. War, slavery, tyranny, superstition, famine, and pestilence, the want and misery which fester in modern civilization, are the impelling causes which drive man on, by eliminating poorer types and extending the higher, and hereditary transmission is the power by which advances are fixed, and past advances made the footing for new advances. The individual is the result of changes thus impressed upon and perpetuated through a long series of past individuals, and the social organization takes its form from the individuals of which it is composed. Thus, while this theory is, as Herbert Spencer says, footnote, the study of sociology, conclusion, end of footnote, radical to a degree beyond anything which current radicalism conceives, inasmuch as it looks for changes in the very nature of man, it is at the same time conservative to a degree beyond anything conceived by current conservatism, inasmuch as it holds that no change can avail save these slow changes in men's natures. Philosophers may teach that this does not lessen the duty of endeavouring to reform abuses, just as the theologians who taught predestinarianism insisted on the duty of all to struggle for salvation. But, as generally apprehended, the result is fatalism. Do what we may, the mills of the gods grind on, regardless either of our aid or our hindrance. I allude to this only to illustrate what I take to be the opinion now rapidly spreading and permeating common thought, not that in the search for truth any regard for its effects should be permitted to bias the mind. 
But this I take to be the current view of civilization, that it is the result of forces operating in the way indicated which slowly change the character and improve and elevate the powers of man, that the difference between civilized man and savage is of a long race education which has become permanently fixed in mental organization, and that this improvement tends to go on increasingly to a higher and higher civilization. We have reached such a point that progress seems to be natural with us, and we look forward confidently to the greater achievements of the coming race, some even holding that the progress of science will finally give men immortality and enable them to make bodily the tour not only of the planets, but of the fixed stars, and at length to manufacture suns and systems for themselves. Footnote. Winwood Reed. The Martyrdom of Man. End of footnote. But without soaring to the stars, the moment that this theory of progression, which seems so natural to us amid an advancing civilization, looks around the world, it comes against an enormous fact, the fixed, petrified civilizations. The majority of the human race today have no idea of progress. The majority of the human race today look, as until a few generations ago our own ancestors looked, upon the past as the time of human perfection. The difference between the savage and the civilized man may be explained on the theory that the former is as yet so imperfectly developed that his progress is hardly apparent. But how, upon the theory that human progress is the result of general and continuous causes, shall we account for the civilizations that had progressed so far and then stopped? It cannot be said of the Hindu and of the Chinaman, as it may be said of the savage, that our superiority is the result of a longer education that we are, as it were, the grown men of nature, while they are the children. The Hindus and the Chinese were civilized when we were savages. They had great cities, highly organized and powerful governments, literatures, philosophies, polished manners, considerable division of labor, large commerce and elaborate arts, when our ancestors were wandering barbarians, living in huts and skin tents, not a whit further advanced than the American Indians. While we have progressed from this savage state to nineteenth-century civilization, they have stood still. If progress be the result of fixed laws, inevitable and eternal, which impel men forward, how shall we account for this? One of the best popular expounders of the development philosophy, Walter Badgett, Physics and Politics, admits the force of this objection, and endeavors in this way to explain it that the first thing necessary to civilize man is to tame him, to induce him to live in association with his fellows in subordination to law, and hence a body or cake of laws and customs grows up, being intensified and extended by natural selection, the tribe or nation thus bound together having an advantage over those who are not, that this cake of custom and law finally becomes too thick and hard to permit further progress, which can go on only as circumstances occur which introduce discussion, and thus permit the freedom and mobility necessary to improvement. This explanation, which Mr. Badgett offers, as he says, with some misgivings, is, I think, at the expense of the general theory. But it is not worth while speaking of that, for it manifestly does not explain the facts. The hardening tendency of which Mr. Badgett speaks would show itself at a very early period of development, and his illustrations of it are nearly all drawn from savage or semi-savage life. Whereas these arrested civilizations had gone a long distance before they stopped. There must have been a time when they were very far advanced as compared with the savage state, and were yet plastic, free, and advancing. These arrested civilizations stopped at a point which was hardly in anything inferior and in many respects superior to European civilization of, say, the sixteenth or at any rate the fifteenth century. Up to that point, then, there must have been discussion, the hailing of what was new and mental activity of all sorts. They had architects who carried the art of building, necessarily by a series of innovations or improvements, up to a very high point. Shipbuilders who, in the same way, by innovation after innovation, finally produced as good a vessel as the warships of Henry the Eighth, Inventors who stopped only on the verge of our most important improvements, and from some of whom we can yet learn. Engineers who constructed great irrigation works and navigable canals. 
rival schools of philosophy and conflicting ideas of religion. One great religion, in many respects resembling Christianity, rose in India, displaced the old religion, passed into China, sweeping over that country, and was displaced again in its old seats, just as Christianity was displaced in its first seats. There was life, and active life, and the innovation that begets improvement, long after men had learnt to live together. And, moreover, both India and China have received the infusion of new life in conquering races with different customs and modes of thought. The most fixed and petrified of all civilizations of which we know anything was that of Egypt, where even art finally assumed a conventional and inflexible form. But we know that behind this must have been a time of life and vigor, a freshly developing and expanding civilization such as ours is now or the arts and sciences could never have been carried to such a pitch. And recent excavations have brought to light from beneath what we before knew of Egypt and earlier Egypt still, in statues and carvings which, instead of a hard and formal type, beam with life and expression, which show art struggling, ardent, natural and free, the sure indication of an active and expanding life. So it must have been once with all now unprogressive civilizations. But it is not merely these arrested civilizations that the current theory of development fails to account for. It is not merely that men have gone so far on the path of progress and then stopped. It is that men have gone far on the path of progress and then gone back. It is not merely an isolated case that thus confronts the theory. It is the universal rule. Every civilization that the world has yet seen has had its period of vigorous growth, of arrest and stagnation, its decline and fall. Of all the civilizations that have arisen and flourished, there remain today but those that have been arrested, and our own, which is not yet as old as were the pyramids when Abraham looked upon them, while behind the pyramids were twenty centuries of recorded history. That our own civilization has a broader base, is of a more advanced type, moves quicker and soars higher than any preceding civilization is undoubtedly true. But in these respects it is hardly more in advance of the Greco-Roman civilization than that was in advance of Asiatic civilization. And if it were, that would prove nothing as to its permanence and future advance, unless it be shown that it is superior in those things which caused the ultimate failure of its predecessors. The current theory does not assume this. In truth, nothing could be further from explaining the facts of universal history than this theory that civilization is the result of a course of natural selection which operates to improve and elevate the powers of man. That civilization has arisen at different times in different places and has progressed at different rates is not inconsistent with this theory for that might result from the unequal balancing of impelling and resisting forces. But that progress everywhere commencing, for even among the lowest tribes it is held that there has been some progress, has nowhere been continuous, but has everywhere been brought to a stand or retrogression, is absolutely inconsistent. For if progress operated to fix an improvement in man's nature and thus to produce further progress, though there might be occasional interruption, yet the general rule would be that progress would be continuous, that advance would lead to advance, and civilization develop into higher civilization. Not merely the general rule, but the universal rule is the reverse of this. The earth is the tomb of the dead empires, no less than of dead men. Instead of progress fitting men for greater progress, every civilization that was in its own time as vigorous and advancing as ours is now has of itself come to a stop. Over and over again, art has declined, learning sunk, power waned, population become sparse, until the people who had built great temples and mighty cities, turned rivers and pierced mountains, cultivated the earth like a garden, and introduced the utmost refinement into the minute affairs of life, remained but in a remnant of squalid barbarians, who had lost even the memory of what their ancestors had done, and regarded the surviving fragments of their grandeur as the work of genii, or of the mighty race before the flood. So true is this, that when we think of the past, it seems like the inexorable law, from which we can no more hope to be exempt than the young man who, 
feels his life in every limb, can hope to be exempt from the dissolution which is the common fate of all. Even this, O Rome, must one day be thy fate, wet Scipio over the ruins of Carthage, and Macaulay's picture of the New Zealander musing upon the broken arch of London Bridge appeals to the imagination of even those who see cities rising in the wilderness and help to lay the foundations of new empire. And so, when we erect a public building, we make a hollow in the largest cornerstone and carefully seal within it some mementos of our day, looking forward to the time when our works shall be ruins and ourselves forgot. Nor whether this alternate rise and fall of civilization, this retrogression that always follows progression, be or be not the rhythmic movement of an ascending line, and I think, though I will not open the question, that it would be much more difficult to prove the affirmative than is generally supposed, makes no difference. For the current theory is in either case disproved. Civilizations have died and made no sign, and hard-won progress has been lost to the race forever. But even if it be admitted that each wave of progress has made possible a higher wave, and each civilization passed the torch to a greater civilization, the theory that civilization advances by changes wrought in the nature of man fails to explain the facts. For in every case it is not the race that has been educated and hereditarily modified by the old civilization that begins the new, but a fresh race coming from a lower level. It is the barbarians of the one epoch who have been the civilized men of the next, to be in their turn succeeded by fresh barbarians. For it has been heretofore always the case that men under the influences of civilization, though at first improving, afterward degenerate. The civilized man of today is vastly the superior of the uncivilized, but so in the time of its vigor was the civilized man of every dead civilization. But there are such things as the vices, the corruptions, the innovations of civilization, which past a certain point have always heretofore shown themselves. Every civilization that has been overwhelmed by barbarians has really perished from internal decay. This universal fact, the moment that it is recognized, disposes of the theory that progress is by hereditary transmission. Looking over the history of the world, the line of greatest advance does not coincide for any length of time with any line of heredity. On any particular line of heredity, retrogression seems always to follow advance. Shall we therefore say that there is a national or race life, as there is an individual life, that every social aggregate has, as it were, a certain amount of energy, the expenditure of which necessitates decay? This is an old and widespread idea that is yet largely held, and that may be constantly seen cropping out incongruously in the writings of the expounders of the development philosophy. Indeed, I do not see why it may not be stated in terms of matter and of motion so as to bring it clearly within the generalizations of evolution. For considering its individuals as atoms, the growth of society is an integration of matter and concomitant dissipation of motion, during which the matter passes from an indefinite incoherent homogeneity to a definite coherent heterogeneity, and during which the retained motion undergoes a parallel transformation. Footnote. Herbert Spencer's Definition of Evolution. First Principles. Page 396. End of footnote. And thus an analogy may be drawn between the life of a society and the life of a solar system upon the nebula hypothesis. As the heat and light of the sun are produced by the aggregation of atoms evolving motion, which finally ceases when the atoms at length come to a state of equilibrium or rest, and a state of immobility succeeds, which can be broken in again only by the impact of external forces, which reverse the process of evolution, integrating motion and dissipating matter in the form of gas, again to evolve motion by its condensation. So, it may be said, does the aggregation of individuals in a community evolve a force which produces the light and warmth of civilization, but when this process ceases and the individual components are brought into a state of equilibrium, assuming their fixed places, petrifaction ensues, and the breaking up and diffusion caused by an incursion of barbarians is necessary to the recommencement of the process and a new growth of civilization. 
But analogies are the most dangerous modes of thought. They may connect resemblances and yet disguise or cover up the truth. And all such analogies are superficial. While its members are constantly reproduced in all the fresh vigor of childhood, a community cannot grow old, as does a man, by the decay of its powers. While its aggregate force must be the sum of the forces of its individual components, a community cannot lose vital power unless the vital powers of its components are lessened. Yet in both the common analogy which likens the life-power of a nation to that of an individual, and in the one I have supposed, lurks the recognition of an obvious truth, the truth that the obstacles which finally bring progress to a halt are raised by the course of progress, that what has destroyed all previous civilizations has been the conditions produced by the growth of civilization itself. This is a truth which in the current philosophy is ignored, but it is a truth most pregnant. Any valid theory of human progress must account for it. End of Book 10, Chapter 1 Recording by Tim Makarios idiophilus.wordpress.com Book 10, Chapter 2 of Progress and Poverty by Henry George this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 10, Chapter 2 Differences in Civilization To What Due In attempting to discover the law of human progress, the first step must be to determine the essential nature of these differences which we describe as differences in civilization. That the current philosophy, which attributes social progress to changes wrought in the nature of man, does not accord with historical facts, we have already seen. And we may also see, if we consider them, that the differences between communities in different stages of civilization cannot be ascribed to innate differences in the individuals who compose these communities. That there are natural differences is true, and that there is such a thing as hereditary transmission of peculiarities is undoubtedly true. But the great differences between men in different states of society cannot be explained in this way. The influence of heredity, which is now the fashion to rate so highly, is as nothing compared with the influences which mould the man after he comes into the world. What is more ingrained in habit than language, which becomes not merely an automatic trick of the muscles, but the medium of thought? What persists longer or will quicker show nationality? Yet we are not born with a predisposition to any language. Our mother tongue is our mother tongue only because we learnt it in infancy. Although his ancestors have thought and spoken in one language for countless generations, a child who hears from the first nothing else will learn with equal facility any other tongue. And so of other national or local or class peculiarities. They seem to be matters of education and habit, not of transmission. Cases of white children captured by Indians in infancy and brought up in the wigwam show this. They become thorough Indians and so, I believe, with children brought up by gypsies. That this is not so true of the children of Indians or other distinctly marked races brought up by whites is, I think, due to the fact that they are never treated precisely as white children. A gentleman who had taught a coloured school once told me that he thought the coloured children, up to the age of ten or twelve, were really brighter and learned more readily than white children, but that after that age they seemed to get dull and careless. He thought this proof of innate race inferiority, and so did I at the time. But I afterward heard a highly intelligent negro gentleman, Bishop Hillary, incidentally make a remark which to my mind seems a sufficient explanation. He said, Our children, when they are young, are fully as bright as white children, and learn as readily. But as soon as they get old enough to appreciate their status, to realize that they are looked upon as belonging to an inferior race, and can never hope to be anything more than cooks, waiters, or something of that sort, they lose their ambition and cease to keep up. And to this he might have added that being the children of poor, uncultivated, and unambitious parents, home influences told against them. 
for I believe it is a matter of common observation that in the primary part of education the children of ignorant parents are quite as receptive as the children of intelligent parents, but by and by the latter, as a general rule, pull ahead and make the most intelligent men and women. The reason is plain. As to the first simple things which they learn only at school, they are on a par, but as their studies become more complex, the child who at home is accustomed to good English, hears intelligent conversation, has access to books, can get questions answered, etc., has an advantage which tells. The same thing may be seen in later life. Take a man who has raised himself from the ranks of common labour, and just as he is brought into contact with men of culture and men of affairs, will he become more intelligent and polished. Take two brothers, the sons of poor parents, brought up in the same home and in the same way. One is put to a rude trade and never gets beyond the necessity of making a living by hard daily labour. The other, commencing as an errand boy, gets a start in another direction, and becomes finally a successful lawyer, merchant, or politician. At forty or fifty the contrast between them will be striking, and the unreflecting will credit it to the greater natural ability which has enabled the one to push himself ahead. But just as striking a difference in manners and intelligence will be manifested between two sisters, one of whom, married to a man who has remained poor, has her life fretted with petty cares and devoid of opportunities, and the other of whom has married a man whose subsequent position brings her into cultured society and opens to her opportunities which refine taste and expand intelligence. And so deteriorations may be seen. That evil communications corrupt good manners is but an expression of the general law that human character is profoundly modified by its conditions and surroundings. I remember once seeing, in a Brazilian seaport, a negro man dressed in what was an evident attempt at the height of fashion, but without shoes and stockings. One of the sailors with whom I was in company, and who had made some runs in the slave trade, had a theory that a negro was not a man, but a sort of monkey, and pointed to this as evidence in proof, contending that it was not natural for a negro to wear shoes, and that in his wild state he would wear no clothes at all. I afterward learnt that it was not considered the thing there for slaves to wear shoes, just as in England it is not considered the thing for a faultlessly attired butler to wear jewellery, though for that matter I have since seen white men at liberty to dress as they pleased get themselves up as incongruously as the Brazilian slave. But a great many of the facts adduced as showing hereditary transmission have really no more bearing than this of our fox or Darwinian. That, for instance, a large number of criminals and recipients of public relief in New York have been shown to have descended from a pauper three or four generations back is extensively cited as showing hereditary transmission. But it shows nothing of the kind, inasmuch as an adequate explanation of the facts is nearer. Paupers will raise paupers, even if the children be not their own, just as familiar contact with criminals will make criminals of the children of virtuous parents. To learn to rely on charity is necessarily to lose the self-respect and independence necessary for self-reliance when the struggle is hard. So true is this that, as is well known, charity has the effect of increasing the demand for charity, and it is an open question whether public relief and private arms do not in this way do far more harm than good. And so of the disposition of children to show the same feelings, tastes, prejudices, or talents as their parents. They imbibe these dispositions just as they imbibe from their habitual associates. And the exceptions prove the rule, as dislikes or revulsions may be excited. And there is, I think, a subtler influence which often accounts for what are looked upon as atavisms of character the same influence that makes the boy who reads dime novels want to be a pirate. I once knew a gentleman in whose veins ran the blood of Indian chiefs. He used to tell me traditions learnt from his grandfather, which illustrated what is difficult for a white man to comprehend, the Indian habit of thought, the intense but patient bloodthirst of the trail, and the fortitude of the stake. 
From the way in which he dwelt on these, I have no doubt that under certain circumstances, highly educated, civilized man that he was, he would have shown traits which would have been looked on as due to his Indian blood, but which in reality would have been sufficiently explained by the broodings of his imagination upon the deeds of his ancestors. Footnote. Wordsworth, in his Song at the Feast of Brougham Castle, has in highly poetical form alluded to this influence. Armour rusting in his halls, on the blood of Clifford calls, Quell the Scot, exclaims the lance, bear me to the heart of France, is the longing of the shield. End of footnote. In any large community we may see, as between different classes and groups, differences of the same kind as those which exist between communities which we speak of as differing in civilization, differences of knowledge, belief, customs, tastes, and speech, which in their extremes show among people of the same race, living in the same country, differences almost as great as those between civilized and savage communities. As all stages of social development, from the Stone Age up, are yet to be found in contemporaneously existing communities, so in the same country and in the same city are to be found, side by side, groups which show similar diversities. In such countries as England and Germany, children of the same race, born and reared in the same place, will grow up, speaking the language differently, holding different beliefs, following different customs, and showing different tastes. And even in such a country as the United States, differences of the same kind, though not of the same degree, may be seen between different circles or groups. But these differences are certainly not innate. No baby is born a Methodist or Catholic, to drop its H's or to sound them. All these differences which distinguish different groups or circles are derived from association in these circles. The Janissaries were made up of youths torn from Christian parents at an early age, but they were nonetheless fanatical Muslims and nonetheless exhibited all the Turkish traits. The Jesuits and other orders show distinct character, but it is certainly not perpetuated by hereditary transmissions and even such associations as schools or regiments, where the components remain but a short time and are constantly changing, exhibit general characteristics, which are the result of mental impressions perpetuated by association. Now, it is this body of traditions, beliefs, customs, laws, habits and associations, which arise in every community and which surround every individual, this superorganic environment, as Herbert Spencer calls it, that, as I take it, is the great element in determining national character. It is this, rather than hereditary transmission, which makes the Englishman differ from the Frenchman, the German from the Italian, the American from the Chinaman, and the civilized man from the savage man. It is in this way that national traits are preserved, extended, or altered. Within certain limits, or, if you choose, without limits in itself, hereditary transmission may develop or alter qualities, but this is much more true of the physical than of the mental part of a man, and much more true of animals than it is even of the physical part of man. Deductions from the breeding of pigeons or cattle will not apply to man, and the reason is clear. The life of man, even in his rudest state, is infinitely more complex. He is constantly acted on by an infinitely greater number of influences, amid which the relative influence of heredity becomes less and less. A race of men with no greater mental activity than the animals, men who only ate, drank, slept, and propagated, might, I doubt not, by careful treatment and selection and breeding, be made, in course of time, to exhibit as great diversities in bodily shape and character as similar means have produced in the domestic animals. But there are no such men, and in men as they are, mental influences, acting through the mind upon the body, would constantly interrupt the process. You cannot fatten a man whose mind is on the strain, by cooping him up and feeding him as you would fatten a pig. In all probability, men have been upon the earth longer than many species of animals. They have been separated from each other under differences of climate that produce the most marked differences in animals, and yet the physical differences between the different races of men are hardly greater than the difference between white horses and black horses. 
they are certainly nothing like as great as between dogs of the same subspecies, as, for instance, the different varieties of the terrier or spaniel. And even these physical differences between races of men, it is held by those who account for them by natural selection and hereditary transmission, were brought out when man was much nearer the animal, that is to say, when he had less mind. And if this be true of the physical constitution of man, in how much higher degree is it true of his mental constitution? All our physical parts we bring with us into the world, but the mind develops afterward. There is a stage in the growth of every organism in which it cannot be told, except by the environment, whether the animal that is to be will be fish or reptile, monkey or man. And so with the newborn infant, whether the mind that is yet to awake to consciousness and power is to be English or German, American or Chinese, the mind of a civilized man or the mind of a savage depends entirely on the social environment in which it is placed. Take a number of infants born of the most highly civilized parents and transport them to an uninhabited country. Suppose them in some miraculous way to be sustained until they come of age to take care of themselves, and what would you have? More helpless savages than any we know of. They would have fire to discover, the rudest tools and weapons to invent, language to construct. They would, in short, have to stumble their way to the simplest knowledge which the lowest races now possess, just as a child learns to walk. That they would in time do all these things I have not the slightest doubt, for all these possibilities are latent in the human mind, just as the power of walking is latent in the human frame, but I do not believe they would do them any better or worse, any slower or quicker, than the children of barbarian parents placed in the same conditions. Given the very highest mental powers that exceptional individuals have ever displayed, and what could mankind be if one generation were separated from the next by an interval of time, as are the seventeen-year locusts? One such interval would reduce mankind not to savagery, but to a condition compared with which savagery, as we know it, would seem civilization. And reversely, suppose a number of savage infants could, unknown to the mothers, for even this would be necessary to make the experiment a fair one, be substituted for as many children of civilization, can we suppose that growing up they would show any difference? I think no one who has mixed much with different peoples and classes will think so. The great lesson that is thus learnt is that human nature is human nature all the world over, and this lesson too may be learnt in the library. I speak not so much of the accounts of travellers, for the accounts given of savages by the civilized men who write books are very often just such accounts as savages would give of us did they make flying visits and then write books, but of those mementos of the life and thoughts of other times and other peoples which, translated into our language of today, are like glimpses of our own lives and gleams of our own thought. The feeling they inspire is that of the essential similarity of men. This, says Emmanuel Deutsch, this is the end of all investigation into history or art. They were even as we are. There is a people to be found in all parts of the world who well illustrate what peculiarities are due to hereditary transmission and what to transmission by association. The Jews have maintained the purity of their blood more scrupulously and for a far longer time than any of the European races, yet I am inclined to think that the only characteristic that can be attributed to this is that of physiognomy, and this is in reality far less marked than is conventionally supposed, as any one who will take the trouble may see on observation. Although they have constantly married among themselves, the Jews have everywhere been modified by their surroundings. The English, Russian, Polish, German, and Oriental Jews differing from each other in many respects as much as do the other people of those countries. Yet they have much in common, and have everywhere preserved their individuality. The reason is clear. It is the Hebrew religion, and certainly religion is not transmitted by generation but by association, which has everywhere preserved the distinctiveness of the Hebrew race. 
This religion, which children derive, not as they derive their physical characteristics, but by precept and association, is not merely exclusive in its teachings, but has, by engendering suspicion and dislike, produced a powerful outside pressure which, even more than its precepts, has everywhere constituted of the Jews a community within a community. Thus has been built up and maintained a certain peculiar environment which gives a distinctive character. Jewish intermarriage has been the effect, not the cause of this. What persecution which stopped short of taking Jewish children from their parents and bringing them up outside of this peculiar environment could not accomplish, will be accomplished by the lessening intensity of religious belief, as is already evident in the United States, where the distinction between Jew and Gentile is fast disappearing. And it seems to me that the influence of this social net or environment will explain what is so often taken as proof of race differences, the difficulty which less civilized races show in receiving higher civilization, and the manner in which some of them melt away before it. Just as one social environment persists, so does it render it difficult or impossible for those subject to it to accept another. The Chinese character is fixed if that of any people is. Yet the Chinese in California acquire American modes of working, trading, the use of machinery, etc., with such facility as to prove that they have no lack of flexibility or natural capacity. That they do not change in other respects is due to the Chinese environment that still persists and still surrounds them. Coming from China, they look forward to return to China, and live while here in a little China of their own, just as the Englishmen in India maintain a little England. It is not merely that we naturally seek association with those who share our peculiarities, and that thus language, religion, and custom tend to persist where individuals are not absolutely isolated, but that these differences provoke an external pressure which compels such association. These obvious principles fully account for all the phenomena which are seen in the meeting of one stage or body of culture with another, without resort to the theory of ingrained differences. For instance, as comparative philology has shown, the Hindu is of the same race as his English conqueror, and individual instances have abundantly shown that if he could be placed completely and exclusively in the English environment, which, as before stated, could be thoroughly done only by placing infants in English families in such a way that neither they, as they grow up, nor those around them, would be conscious of any distinction, one generation would be all required to thoroughly implant European civilization. But the progress of English ideas and habits in India must be necessarily very slow, because they meet there the web of ideas and habits constantly perpetuated through an immense population, and interlaced with every act of life. Mr. Badgett, Physics and Politics, endeavours to explain the reason why barbarians waste away before our civilization, while well, they did not before that of the ancients, by assuming that the progress of civilization has given us tougher physical constitutions. After alluding to the fact that there is no lament in any classical writer for the barbarians, but that everywhere the barbarian endured the contact with the Roman, and the Roman allied himself to the barbarian, he says, pages 47 to 48, Savages in the first year of the Christian era were pretty much what they were in the 1800th, and if they stood the contact of ancient civilized men and cannot stand ours, it follows that our race is presumably tougher than the ancient, for we have to bear and do bear the seeds of greater diseases than the ancients carried with them. We may use, perhaps, the unvarying savage as a meter to gauge the vigor of the constitution to whose contact he is exposed. Mr. Badgett does not attempt to explain how it is that 1800 years ago civilization did not give the like relative advantage over barbarism that it does now. But there is no use of talking about that, or of the lack of proof that the human constitution has been a whit improved. To anyone who has seen how the contact of our civilization affects the inferior races, a much readier though less flattering explanation will occur. 
It is not because our constitutions are naturally tougher than those of the savage, that diseases which are comparatively innocuous to us are certain death to him. It is that we know and have the means of treating those diseases, while he is destitute both of knowledge and means. The same diseases with which the scum of civilization that floats in its advance inoculates the savage would prove as destructive to civilized men if they knew no better than to let them run, as he in his ignorance has to let them run, and as a matter of fact they were as destructive until we found out how to treat them. And not merely this, but the effect of the impingement of civilization upon barbarism is to weaken the power of the savage without bringing him into the conditions that give power to the civilized man. While his habits and customs still tend to persist, and do persist as far as they can, the conditions to which they were adapted are forcibly changed. He is a hunter in a land stripped of game, a warrior deprived of his arms and called on to plead in legal technicalities. He is not merely placed between cultures, but, as Mr. Badgett says of the European half-breeds in India, he is placed between moralities and learns the vices of civilization without its virtues. He loses his accustomed means of subsistence, he loses self-respect, he loses morality, he deteriorates and dies away. The miserable creatures who may be seen hanging around frontier towns or railroad stations, ready to beg, or steal, or solicit a viler commerce, are not fair representatives of the Indian before the white man had encroached upon his hunting grounds. They have lost the strength and virtues of their former state, without gaining those of a higher. In fact, civilization, as it pushes the red man, shows no virtues. To the Anglo-Saxon of the frontier, as a rule, the aborigine has no rights which the white man is bound to respect. He is impoverished, misunderstood, cheated, and abused. He dies out, as, under similar conditions, we should die out. He disappears before civilization as the Britons disappeared before Saxon barbarism. The true reason why there is no lament in any classic writer for the barbarian, but that the Roman civilization assimilated instead of destroying, is, I take it, to be found not only in the fact that the ancient civilization was much nearer akin to the barbarians which it met, but in the more important fact that it was not extended as ours has been. It was carried forward, not by an advancing line of colonists, but by conquest which merely reduced the new province to general subjection, leaving the social and generally the political organization of the people to a great degree unimpaired, so that, without shattering or deterioration, the process of assimilation went on. In a somewhat similar way, the civilization of Japan seems to be now assimilating itself to European civilization. In America, the Anglo-Saxon has exterminated, instead of civilizing, the Indian, simply because he has not brought the Indian into his environment, nor yet has the contact been in such a way as to induce or permit the Indian web of habitual thought and custom to be changed rapidly enough to meet the new conditions into which he has been brought by the proximity of new and powerful neighbors. That there is no innate impediment to the reception of our civilization by these uncivilized races has been shown over and over again in individual cases. And it has likewise been shown, so far as the experiments have been permitted to go, by the Jesuits in Paraguay, the Franciscans in California, and the Protestant missionaries on some of the Pacific Islands. The assumption of physical improvement in the race within any time of which we have knowledge is utterly without warrant, and within the time of which Mr. Badgett speaks it is absolutely disproved. We know from classic statues, from the burdens carried and the marches made by ancient soldiers, from the records of runners and the feats of gymnasts, that neither in proportions nor strength has the race improved within two thousand years. But the assumption of mental improvement, which is even more confidently and generally made, is still more preposterous. As poets, artists, architects, philosophers, rhetoricians, statesmen, or soldiers, can modern civilization show individuals of greater mental power than can the ancient? There is no use in recalling names. Every schoolboy knows them. 
For our models and personifications of mental power we go back to the ancients, and if we can for a moment imagine the possibility of what is held by that oldest and most widespread of all beliefs, that belief which Lessing declared on this account the most probably true, though he accepted it on metaphysical grounds, and suppose Homer or Virgil, Demosthenes or Cicero, Alexander, Hannibal or Caesar, Plato or Lucretius, Euclid or Aristotle, as re-entering this life again in the nineteenth century, can we suppose that they would show any inferiority to the men of today? Or if we take any period since the classic age, even the darkest, or any previous period of which we know anything, shall we not find men who in the conditions and degree of knowledge of their times showed mental power of as high an order as men show now? And among the less advanced races do we not today, whenever our attention is called to them, find men who in their conditions exhibit mental qualities as great as civilization can show? Did the invention of the railroad, coming when it did, prove any greater inventive power than did the invention of the wheelbarrow when wheelbarrows were not? We of modern civilization are raised far above those who have preceded us and those of the less advanced races who are our contemporaries. But it is because we stand on a pyramid, not that we are taller. What the centuries have done for us is not to increase our stature, but to build up a structure on which we may plant our feet. Let me repeat, I do not mean to say that all men possess the same capacities, or are mentally alike, any more than I mean to say that they are physically alike. Among all the countless millions who have come and gone on this earth, there were probably never two who either physically or mentally were exact counterparts. Nor yet do I mean to say that there are not as clearly marked race differences in mind as there are clearly marked race differences in body. I do not deny the influence of heredity in transmitting peculiarities of mind in the same way, and possibly to the same degree, as bodily peculiarities are transmitted. But nevertheless there is, it seems to me, a common standard and natural symmetry of mind, as there is of body, toward which all deviations tend to return. The conditions under which we fall may produce such distortions as the flatheads produce by compressing the heads of their infants, or the Chinese by binding their daughters' feet. But as flathead babies continue to be born with naturally shaped heads, and Chinese babies with naturally shaped feet, so does nature seem to revert to the normal mental type. A child no more inherits his father's knowledge than he inherits his father's glass eye or artificial leg. The child of the most ignorant parents may become a pioneer of science or a leader of thought. But this is the great fact with which we are concerned, that the differences between the people of communities in different places and at different times, which we call differences of civilization, are not differences which inhere in the individuals, but differences which inhere in the society that they are not, as Herbert Spencer holds, differences resulting from differences in the units, but that they are differences resulting from the conditions under which these units are brought in the society. In short, I take the explanation of the differences which distinguish communities to be this, that each society, small or great, necessarily weaves for itself a web of knowledge, beliefs, customs, language, tastes, institutions, and laws, into this web, woven by each society, or rather, into these webs, for each community above the simplest is made up of minor societies, which overlap and interlace with each other, the individual is received at birth and continues until his death. This is the matrix in which mind unfolds and from which it takes its stamp. This is the way in which customs and religions and prejudices and tastes and languages grow up and are perpetuated. This is the way that skill is transmitted and knowledge is stored up, and the discoveries of one time made the common stock and stepping stone of the next. Though it is this that often offers the most serious obstacles to progress, it is this that makes progress possible. It is this that enables any schoolboy in our time to learn in a few hours more of the universe than Ptolemy knew, that places the most humdrum scientist far above the level reached by the giant mind of Aristotle. 
This is to the race what memory is to the individual. Our wonderful arts, our far-reaching science, our marvelous inventions, they have come through this. Human progress goes on as the advances made by one generation are in this way secured as the common property of the next, and made the starting point for new advances. End of Book 10, Chapter 2 Recording by Tim Makarios idiophilus.wordpress.com Book 10, Chapter 3, Paragraphs 1 to 21 of Progress and Poverty by Henry George. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 10, Chapter 3 the law of human progress. What then is the law of human progress, the law under which civilization advances? It must explain clearly and definitely, and not by vague generalities or superficial analogies, why, though mankind started presumably with the same capacities and at the same time, there now exist such wide differences in social development. It must account for the arrested civilizations and for the decayed and destroyed civilizations, for the general facts as to the rise of civilization, and for the petrifying or enervating force which the progress of civilization has heretofore always evolved. It must account for retrogression as well as for progression, for the differences in general character between Asiatic and European civilizations, for the difference between classical and modern civilizations, for the different rates at which progress goes on, and for those bursts and starts and halts of progress which are so marked as minor phenomena. And thus it must show us what are the essential conditions of progress, and what social adjustments advance and what retard it. It is not difficult to discover such a law. We have but to look and we may see it. I do not pretend to give it scientific precision, but merely to point it out. The incentives to progress are the desires inherent in human nature, the desire to gratify the wants of the animal nature, the wants of the intellectual nature, and the wants of the sympathetic nature, the desire to be, to know, and to do. Desires that short of infinity can never be satisfied, as they grow by what they feed on. Mind is the instrument by which man advances, and by which each advance is secured and made the vantage ground for new advances. Though he may not by taking thought to add a cubit to his stature, man may by taking thought extend his knowledge of the universe and his power over it, in what, so far as we can see, is an infinite degree. The narrow span of human life allows the individual to go but a short distance, but though each generation may do but little, yet generations, succeeding to the gain of their predecessors, may gradually elevate the status of mankind, as coral polyps, building one generation upon the work of another, gradually elevate themselves from the bottom of the sea. Mental power is, therefore, the motor of progress, and men tend to advance in proportion to the mental power expended in progression, the mental power which is devoted to the extension of knowledge, the improvement of methods, and the betterment of social conditions. Now, mental power is a fixed quantity. That is to say, there is a limit to the work a man can do with his mind, as there is to the work he can do with his body. Therefore, the mental power which can be devoted to progress is only what is left after what is required for non-progressive purposes. These non-progressive purposes in which mental power is consumed may be classified as maintenance and conflict. By maintenance I mean not only the support of existence, but the keeping up of the social condition and the holding of advances already gained. By conflict, I mean not merely warfare and preparation for warfare, but all expenditure of mental power in seeking the gratification of desire at the expense of others, and in resistance to such aggression. To compare society to a boat. Her progress through the water will not depend on the exertion of her crew, 
but upon the exertion devoted to propelling her. This will be lessened by any expenditure of force required for bailing, or any expenditure of force in fighting among themselves, or in pulling in different directions. Now, as in a separated state the whole powers of man are required to maintain existence, and mental power is set free for higher uses only by the association of men in communities, which permits the division of labor and all the economies which come with the cooperation of increased numbers, association is the first essential of progress. Improvement becomes possible as men come together in peaceful association, and the wider and closer the association, the greater the possibilities of improvement. And as the wasteful expenditure of mental power in conflict becomes greater or less as the moral law which accords to each an equality of rights is ignored or recognized, equality, or justice, is the second essential of progress. Thus association in equality is the law of progress. Association frees mental power for expenditure in improvement, and equality or justice or freedom, for the terms here signify the same thing, the recognition of the moral law, prevents the dissipation of this power in fruitless struggles. Here is the law of progress, which will explain all diversities, all advances, all halts and retrogressions. Men tend to progress just as they come closer together, and by cooperation with each other increase the mental power that may be devoted to improvement. But just as conflict is provoked, or association develops inequality of condition and power, this tendency to progression is lessened, checked, and finally reversed. Given the same innate capacity, and it is evident that social development will go on faster or slower, will stop or turn back, according to the resistances it meets. In a general way, these obstacles to improvement may, in relation to the society itself, be classed as external and internal. The first operating with greater force in the earlier stages of civilization, the latter becoming more important in the later stages. Man is social in his nature. He does not require to be caught and tamed in order to induce him to live with his fellows. The utter helplessness with which he enters the world, and the long period required for the maturity of his powers, necessitate the family relation, which, as we may observe, is wider, and in its extension stronger, among the ruder than among the more cultivated peoples. The first societies are families, expanding into tribes, still holding a mutual blood relationship, and even when they have become great nations, claiming a common descent. Given beings of this kind, placed on a globe of such diversified surface and climate as this, and it is evident that, even with equal capacity and an equal start, social development must be very different. The first limit or resistance to association will come from the conditions of physical nature, and as these greatly vary with locality, corresponding differences in social progress must show themselves. The net rapidity of increase, and the closeness with which men, as they increase, can keep together, will, in the rude state of knowledge in which reliance for subsistence must be principally on the spontaneous offerings of nature, very largely depend upon climate, soil, and physical conformation. Where much animal food and warm clothing are required, where the earth seems poor and niggard, where the exuberant life of tropical forests mocks barbarous man's puny efforts to control, where mountains, deserts, or arms of the sea separate and isolate men, association and the power of improvement which it evolves can at first go but a little way. But on the rich plains of warm climates, where human existence can be maintained with a smaller expenditure of force, and from a much smaller area, men can keep closer together, and the mental power which can at first be devoted to improvement is much greater. Hence civilization naturally first arises in the great valleys and tablelands where we find its earliest monuments. But these diversities in natural conditions, not merely thus directly produce diversities in social development, but, by producing diversities in social development, bring out in man himself an obstacle, or rather an act of counterforce, to improvement. 
As families and tribes are separated from each other, the social feeling ceases to operate between them, and differences arise in language, custom, tradition, religion. In short, in the whole social web in which each community, however small or large, constantly spins. With these differences, prejudices grow, animosities spring up, contact easily produces quarrels, aggression begets aggression, and wrong kindles revenge. Footnote. How easy it is for ignorance to pass into contempt and dislike. How natural it is for us to consider any difference in manners, customs, religion, etc., as proof of the inferiority of those who differ from us. Any one who has emancipated himself in any degree from prejudice, and who mixes with different classes, may see in civilized society. In religion, for instance, the spirit of the hymn, I'd rather be a Baptist and wear a shining face than for to be a Methodist and always fall from grace is observable in all denominations. As the English bishop said, Orthodoxy is my doxy, heterodoxy is any other doxy, while the universal tendency is to classify all outside of the orthodoxies and heterodoxies of the prevailing religion as heathens or atheists, and the like tendency is observable as to all other differences. End of footnote. And so between these separate social aggregates arises the feeling of Ishmael and the spirit of Cain. Warfare becomes the chronic and seemingly natural relation of societies to each other, and the powers of men are expended in attack or defence, in mutual slaughter and mutual destruction of wealth, or in warlike preparations. How long this hostility persists, the protective tariffs and the standing armies of the civilised world today bear witness. How difficult it is to get over the idea that it is not theft to steal from a foreigner, the difficulty in procuring an international copyright act will show. Can we wonder at the perpetual hostilities of tribes and clans? Can we wonder that when each community was isolated from the others, when each, uninfluenced by the others, was spinning its separate web of social environment, which no individual can escape, that war should have been the rule and peace the exception? They were even as we are. Now, warfare is the negation of association. The separation of men into diverse tribes, by increasing warfare, thus checks improvement. While in the localities where a large increase in numbers is possible without much separation, civilization gains the advantage of exemption from tribal war, even when the community as a whole is carrying on warfare beyond its borders. Thus, where the resistance of nature to the close association of men is slightest, the counterforce of warfare is likely at first to be least felt, and in the rich plains where civilization first begins, it may rise to a great height while scattered tribes are yet barbarous. And thus, when small separated communities exist in a state of chronic warfare which forbids advance, the first step to their civilization is the advent of some conquering tribe or nation that unites these smaller communities into a larger one, in which internal peace is preserved. Where this power of peaceable association is broken up, either by external assaults or internal dissensions, the advance ceases and retrogression begins. But it is not conquest alone that has operated to promote association, and, by liberating mental power from the necessities of warfare, to promote civilization. If the diversities of climate, soil, and configuration of the earth's surface operate at first to separate mankind, they also operate to encourage exchange. And commerce, which is in itself a form of association or cooperation, operates to promote civilization, not only directly, but by building up interests which are opposed to warfare, and dispelling the ignorance which is the fertile mother of prejudices and animosities. And so of religion. Though the forms it has assumed, and the animosities it has aroused, have often sundered men and produced warfare, yet it has at other times been the means of promoting association. A common worship has often, as among the Greeks, mitigated war and furnished the basis of union, while it is from the triumph of Christianity over the barbarians of Europe that modern civilization springs. 
Had not the Christian church existed when the Roman Empire went to pieces, Europe, destitute of any bond of association, might have fallen to a condition not much above that of the North American Indians, or only received civilization with an Asiatic impress from the conquering scimitars of the invading hordes which had been welded into a mighty power by a religion which, springing up in the deserts of Arabia, had united tribes separated from time immemorial, and, thence issuing, brought into the association of a common faith a great part of the human race. Looking over what we know of the history of the world, we thus see civilization everywhere springing up where men are brought into association, and everywhere disappearing as this association is broken up. Thus the Roman civilization, spread over Europe by the conquests which ensured internal peace, was overwhelmed by the incursions of the northern nations that broke society again into disconnected fragments. And the progress that now goes on in our modern civilization began as the feudal system again began to associate men in larger communities, and the spiritual supremacy of Rome to bring these communities into a common relation, as her legions had done before. As the feudal bonds grew into national autonomies, and Christianity worked the amelioration of manners, brought forth the knowledge that during the dark days she had hidden, bound the threads of peaceful union in her all-pervading organization, and taught association in her religious orders, a greater progress became possible which, as men have been brought into closer and closer association and cooperation, has gone on with greater and greater force. But we shall never understand the course of civilization, and the varied phenomena which its history presents, without a consideration of what I may term the internal resistances, or counterforces, which arise in the heart of advancing society, and which can alone explain how a civilization once fairly started should either come of itself to a halt, or be destroyed by barbarians. End of Book 10, Chapter 3 Paragraphs 1 to 21. Recording by Tim Macarios. Idiophilus.wordpress.com. Book 10, Chapter 3, Paragraphs 22 to 47 of Progress and Poverty by Henry George. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The mental power, which is the motor of social progress, is set free by association, which is what, perhaps, it may be more properly called, an integration. Society in this process becomes more complex, its individuals more dependent upon each other. Occupations and functions are specialized. Instead of wandering, population becomes fixed. Instead of each man attempting to supply all of his wants, the various trades and industries are separated. One man acquires skill in one thing, and another in another thing. So too of knowledge, the body of which constantly tends to become vaster than one man can grasp, and is separated into different parts, which different individuals acquire and pursue. So too the performance of religious ceremonies tends to pass into the hands of a body of men specially devoted to that purpose, and the preservation of order, the administration of justice, the assignment of public duties and the distribution of awards, the conduct of war, etc., to be made the special functions of an organized government. In short, to use the language in which Herbert Spencer has defined evolution, the development of society is, in relation to its component individuals, the passing from an indefinite, incoherent homogeneity to a definite, coherent heterogeneity. The lower the stage of social development, the more society resembles one of those lowest of animal organisms which are without organs or limbs, and from which a part may be cut and yet live. The higher the stage of social development, the more society resembles those higher organisms in which functions and powers are specialized, and each member is vitally dependent on the others. Now, this process of integration, of the specialization of functions and powers, as it goes on in society, is, by virtue of what is probably one of the deepest laws of human nature, accompanied by a constant liability to inequality. I do not mean that inequality is the necessary result of social growth, 
but that it is the constant tendency of social growth, if unaccompanied by changes in social adjustments which, in the new conditions that growth produces, will secure equality. I mean, so to speak, that the garment of laws, customs, and political institutions which each society weaves for itself is constantly tending to become too tight as the society develops. I mean, so to speak, that man, as he advances, threads a labyrinth in which, if he keeps straight ahead, he will infallibly lose his way, and through which reason and justice can alone keep him continuously in an ascending path. For, while the integration which accompanies growth tends in itself to set free mental power to work improvement, there is, both with increase of numbers and with increasing complexity of the social organization, a counter-tendency set up to the production of a state of inequality which wastes mental power and, as it increases, brings improvement to a halt. To trace to its highest expression the law which thus operates to evolve with progress the force which stops progress would be, it seems to me, to go far to the solution of a problem deeper than that of the genesis of the material universe, the problem of the genesis of evil. Let me content myself with pointing out the manner in which, as society develops, there arise tendencies which check development. There are two qualities of human nature which it will be well, however, first to call to mind. The one is the power of habit, the tendency to continue to do things in the same way. The other is the possibility of mental and moral deterioration. The effect of the first in social development is to continue habits, customs, laws and methods long after they have lost their original usefulness, and the effect of the other is to permit the growth of institutions and modes of thought from which the normal perceptions of men instinctively revolt. Now the growth and development of society not merely tend to make each more and more dependent upon all, and to lessen the influence of individuals, even over their own conditions, as compared with the influence of society, but the effect of association or integration is to give rise to a collective power which is distinguishable from the sum of individual powers. Analogies, or perhaps rather illustrations of the same law, may be found in all directions, as animal organisms increase in complexity, there arise, above the life and power of the parts, a life and power of the integrated whole, above the capability of involuntary movements, the capability of voluntary movements. The actions and impulses of bodies of men are, as has often been observed, different from those which, under the same circumstances, would be called forth in individuals. The fighting qualities of a regiment may be very different from those of the individual soldiers. But there is no need of illustrations. In our inquiries into the nature and rise of rent, we trace the very thing to which I allude. Where population is sparse, land has no value. Just as men congregate together, the value of land appears and rises, a clearly distinguishable thing from the values produced by individual effort a value which springs from association, which increases as association grows greater, and disappears as association is broken up. And the same thing is true of power in other forms than those generally expressed in terms of wealth. Now, as society grows, the disposition to continue previous social adjustments tends to lodge this collective power, as it arises, in the hands of a portion of the community and this unequal distribution of the wealth and power gained as society advances tends to produce greater inequality, since aggression grows by what it feeds on, and the idea of justice is blurred by the habitual toleration of injustice. In this way the patriarchal organization of society can easily grow into hereditary monarchy, in which the king is as a god on earth, and the masses of the people mere slaves of his caprice. It is natural that the father should be the directing head of the family, and that at his death the eldest son, as the oldest and most experienced member of the little community, should succeed to the headship. But to continue this arrangement as the family expands is to lodge power in a particular line, 
and the power thus lodged necessarily continues to increase, as the common stock becomes larger and larger, and the power of the community grows. The head of the family passes into the hereditary king, who comes to look upon himself and to be looked upon by others as a being of superior rights. With the growth of the collective power as compared with the power of the individual, his power to reward and to punish increases, and so increase the inducements to flatter and to fear him, until finally, if the process not be disturbed, a nation grovels at the foot of a throne, and a hundred thousand men toil for fifty years to prepare a tomb for one of their own mortal kind. So the war-chief of a little band of savages is but one of their number, whom they follow as their bravest and most wary. But when large bodies come to act together, personal selection becomes more difficult, a blinder obedience becomes necessary and can be enforced, and from the very necessities of warfare when conducted on a large scale absolute power arises. And so of the specialization of function. There is a manifest gain in productive power when social growth has gone so far that instead of every producer being summoned from his work for fighting purposes, a regular military force can be specialized. But this inevitability tends to the concentration of power in the hands of the military class or their chiefs. The preservation of internal order, the administration of justice, the construction and care of public works, and, notably, the observances of religion, all tend in similar manner to pass into the hands of special classes, whose disposition it is to magnify their function and extend their power. But the great cause of inequality is in the natural monopoly which is given by the possession of land. The first perceptions of men seem always to be that land is common property. But the rude devices by which this is at first recognized, such as annual partitions or cultivation in common, are consistent with only a low stage of development. The idea of property, which naturally arises with reference to things of human production, is easily transferred to land and an institution which, when population is sparse, merely secures to the improver and user the due reward of his labour, finally, as population becomes dense and rent arises, operates to strip the producer of his wages. Not merely this, but the appropriation of rent for public purposes, which is the only way in which, with anything like a high development, land can be readily retained as common property, becomes, when political and religious power passes into the hands of a class, the ownership of the land by that class, and the rest of the community become merely tenants. And wars and conquests, which tend to the concentration of political power and to the institution of slavery, naturally result where social growth has given land a value in the appropriation of the soil. A dominant class, who concentrate power in their hands, will likewise soon concentrate ownership of the land. To them will fall large partitions of conquered land, which the former inhabitants will till as tenants or serfs, and the public domain or common lands, which in the natural course of social growth are left for a while in every country, and in which state the primitive system of village culture leaves pasture and woodland, are readily acquired, as we see by modern instances. And inequality once established, the ownership of land tends to concentrate as development goes on. I am merely attempting to set forth the general fact that as a social development goes on, inequality tends to establish itself, and not to point out the particular sequence, which must necessarily vary with different conditions. But this main fact makes intelligible all the phenomena of petrifaction and retrogression. The unequal distribution of the power and wealth gained by the integration of men in society tends to check, and finally to counterbalance, the force by which improvements are made and society advances. On the one side, the masses of the community are compelled to expend their mental powers in merely maintaining existence. On the other side, mental power is expended in keeping up and intensifying the system of inequality, in ostentation, luxury and warfare. A community divided into a class that rules and a class that is ruled, into the very rich and the very poor, may build like giants and finish like jewellers. 
but it will be monuments of ruthless pride and barren vanity, or of a religion turned from its office of elevating man into an instrument for keeping him down. Invention may for a while to some degree go on, but it will be the invention of refinements in luxury, not the inventions that relieve toil and increase power. In the arcana of temples, or in the chambers of court physicians, knowledge may still be sought, but it will be hidden as a secret thing, or if it dares come out to elevate common thought or brighten common life, it will be trodden down as a dangerous innovator. For as it tends to lessen the mental power devoted to improvement, so does inequality tend to render men averse to improvement. How strong is the disposition to adhere to old methods among the classes who are kept in ignorance by being compelled to toil for a mere existence is too well known to require illustration. And on the other hand, the conservatism of the classes to whom the existing social adjustment gives special advantages is equally apparent. This tendency to resist innovation, even though it be improvement, is observable in every special organization in religion, in law, in medicine, in science, in trade guilds, and it becomes intense just as the organization is close. A close corporation has always an instinctive dislike of innovation and innovators, which is but the expression of an instinctive fear that change may tend to throw down the barriers which hedge it in from the common herd, and so rob it of importance and power. And it is always disposed to guard carefully its special knowledge or skill. It is in this way that petrifaction succeeds progress. The advance of inequality necessarily brings improvement to a halt, and as it still persists or provokes unavailing reactions, draws even upon the mental power necessary for maintenance, and retrogression begins. These principles make intelligible the history of civilization. In the localities where climate, soil, and physical conformation tend at least to separate men as they increased, and where, accordingly, the first civilizations grew up, the internal resistances to progress would naturally develop in a more regular and thorough manner than where smaller communities, which in their separation had developed diversities, were afterward brought together into a closer association. It is this, it seems to me, which accounts for the general characteristics of the earlier civilizations as compared with the later civilizations of Europe. Such homogeneous communities, developing from the first without the jar of conflict between different customs, laws, religions, etc., would show a much greater uniformity. The concentrating and conservative forces would all, so to speak, pull together. Rival chieftains would not counterbalance each other, nor diversities of belief hold the growth of priestly influence in check. Political and religious power, wealth and knowledge would thus tend to concentrate in the same centres. The same causes which tended to produce the hereditary king and hereditary priest would tend to produce the hereditary artisan and labourer, and to separate society into castes. The power which association sets free for progress would thus be wasted, and barriers to further progress be gradually raised. The surplus energies of the masses would be devoted to the construction of temples, palaces, and pyramids, to ministering to the pride and pampering the luxury of their rulers. And should any disposition to improvement arise among the classes of leisure, it would at once be checked by the dread of innovation. Society developing in this way must at length stop in a conservatism which permits no further progress. How long such a state of complete petrifaction, when once reached, will continue, seems to depend upon external causes, for the iron bonds of the social environment which grows up repress disintegrating forces as well as improvement. Such a community can be most easily conquered, for the masses of the people are trained to a passive acquiescence in a life of hopeless labour. If the conquerors merely take the place of the ruling class, as the Hyksos did in Egypt and the Tartars in China, everything will go on as before. If they ravage and destroy, the glory of palace and temple remains but in ruins, population becomes sparse, and knowledge and art are lost. European civilization differs in character from civilizations of the Egyptian type, 
because it springs not from the association of a homogeneous people developing from the beginning, or at least for a long time, under the same conditions, but from the association of peoples who in separation had acquired distinctive social characteristics, and whose smaller organizations longer prevented the concentration of power and wealth in one center. The physical conformation of the Grecian peninsula is such as to separate the people at first into a number of small communities. As those petty republics and nominal kingdoms ceased to waste their energies in warfare, and the peaceable cooperation of commerce extended, the light of civilization blazed up. But the principle of association was never strong enough to save Greece from intertribal war, and when this was put an end to by conquest, the tendency to inequality, which had been combated with various devices by Grecian sages and statesmen, worked its result, and Grecian valour, art and literature became things of the past. And so in the rise and extension, the decline and fall of Roman civilization, may be seen the working of these two principles of association and equality, from the combination of which springs progress. Springing from the association of the independent husbandmen and free citizens of Italy, and gaining fresh strength from conquests which brought hostile nations into common relations, the Roman power hushed the world in peace. But the tendency to inequality, checking real progress from the first, increased as the Roman civilization extended. The Roman civilization did not petrify as did the homogeneous civilizations where the strong bonds of custom and superstition that held the people in subjection probably also protected them, or at any rate kept the peace between rulers and ruled. It rotted, declined, and fell. Long before Goth or Vandal had broken through the cordon of the legions, even while her frontiers were advancing, Rome was dead at the heart. Great estates had ruined Italy. Inequality had dried up the strength and destroyed the vigour of the Roman world. Government became despotism, which even assassination could not temper. Patriotism became servility. Vices the most foul flouted themselves in public. Literature sank to puerilities. Learning was forgotten. Fertile districts became waste without the ravages of war. Everywhere inequality produced decay, political, mental, moral, and material. The barbarism which overwhelmed Rome came not from without, but from within. It was the necessary product of the system which had substituted slaves and colony for the independent husbandmen of Italy, and carved the provinces into estates of senatorial families. Modern civilization owes its superiority to the growth of equality with the growth of association. Two great causes contributed to this, the splitting up of concentrated power into innumerable little centers by the influx of the northern nations, and the influence of Christianity. Without the first there would have been the petrifaction and slow decay of the eastern empire where church and state were closely married and loss of external power brought no relief of internal tyranny. And but for the other there would have been barbarism without principle of association or amelioration. The petty chiefs and elodial lords who everywhere grasped local sovereignty held each other in check. Italian cities recovered their ancient liberty, free towns were founded, village communities took root, and serfs acquired rights in the soil they tilled. The leaven of Teutonic ideas of equality worked through the disorganized and disjointed fabric of society. And although society was split up into an innumerable number of separated fragments, yet the idea of closer association was always present. It existed in the recollections of a universal empire. It existed in the claims of a universal church. Though Christianity became distorted and alloyed in percolating through a rotting civilization, though pagan gods were taken into her pantheon, and pagan forms into her ritual, and pagan ideas into her creed, yet her essential idea of the equality of men was never wholly destroyed. And two things happened of the utmost moment to incipient civilization, the establishment of the papacy and celibacy of the clergy. The first prevented the spiritual power from concentrating in the same lines as the temporal power, 
and the latter prevented the establishment of a priestly caste during a time when all power tended to hereditary form. In her efforts for the abolition of slavery, in her truce of God, in her monastic orders, in her councils which united nations, and her edicts which ran without regard to political boundaries, in the low-born hands in which she placed a sign before which the proudest knelt, in her bishops who by concentration became the peers of the greatest nobles, in her servant of servants, for so his official title ran, who, by virtue of the ring of a simple fisherman, claimed the right to arbitrate between nations, and whose stirrup was held by kings, the church, in spite of everything, was yet a promoter of association, a witness for the natural equality of men and by the church herself was nurtured a spirit that, when her early work of association and emancipation was well-nigh done, when the ties she had knit had become strong, and the learning she had preserved had been given to the world, broke the chains with which she would have fettered the human mind, and in the great part of Europe rent her organization. The rise and growth of European civilization is too vast and complex a subject to be thrown into proper perspective and relation in a few paragraphs. But in all its details, as in its main features, it illustrates the truth that progress goes on just as society tends toward closer association and greater equality. Civilization is cooperation. Union and liberty are its factors. The great extension of association not alone in the growth of larger and denser communities, but in the increase of commerce and the manifold exchanges which knit each community together and link them with other, though widely separated, communities. The growth of international and municipal law, the advances in security of property and of person, in individual liberty, and towards democratic government, advances, in short, towards the recognition of the equal rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is these that make our modern civilizations so much greater, so much higher, than any that has gone before. It is these that have set free the mental power which has rolled back the veil of ignorance which hid all but a small portion of the globe from men's knowledge, which has measured the orbits of the circling spheres and bids us see moving, pulsing life in a drop of water which has opened to us the antechamber of nature's mysteries and read the secrets of a long-buried past, which has harnessed in our service physical forces beside which man's efforts are puny, and increased productive power by a thousand great inventions. In that spirit of fatalism to which I have alluded as pervading current literature, it is the fashion to speak even of war and slavery as means of human progress. But war, which is the opposite of association, can aid progress only when it prevents further war or breaks down antisocial barriers which are themselves passive war. As for slavery, I cannot see how it could ever have aided in establishing freedom, and freedom, the synonym of equality, is, from the very rudest state in which man can be imagined, the stimulus and condition of progress. Auguste Comte's idea that the institution of slavery destroyed cannibalism is as fanciful as Ilya's humorous notion of the way mankind acquired a taste for roast pig. It assumes that a propensity that has never been found developed in man save as the result of the most unnatural conditions, the direst want or the most brutalizing superstitions, is an original impulse, and that he, even in his lowest state, the highest of all animals, has natural appetites which the nobler brutes do not show. Footnote on Brutalizing Superstitions The Sandwich Islanders did honor to their good chiefs by eating their bodies. Their bad and tyrannical chiefs they would not touch. The New Zealanders had a notion that by eating their enemies they acquired their strength and valour, and this seems to be the general origin of eating prisoners of war. End of footnote. And so of the idea that slavery began civilization by giving slave owners leisure for improvement. Slavery never did and never could aid improvement. Whether the community consist of a single master and a single slave, or of thousands of masters and millions of slaves, slavery necessarily involves a waste of human power. For not only is slave labor less productive than free labor, 
but the power of masters is likewise wasted in holding and watching their slaves, and is called away from directions in which real improvement lies. From first to last, slavery, like every other denial of the natural equality of men, has hampered and prevented progress. Just in proportion as slavery plays an important part in the social organization, does improvement cease. That in the classical world slavery was so universal is undoubtedly the reason why the mental activity which so polished literature and refined art never hit on any of the great discoveries and inventions which distinguish modern civilization. No slaveholding people ever were an inventive people. In a slaveholding community the upper classes may become luxurious and polished, but never inventive. Whatever degrades the laborer and robs him of the fruits of his toil stifles the spirit of invention and forbids the utilization of inventions and discoveries even when made. To freedom alone is given the spell of power which summons the genii in whose keeping are the treasures of earth and the viewless forces of the air. The law of human progress, what is it but the moral law? Just as social adjustments promote justice, just as they acknowledge the equality of right between man and man, just as they ensure to each the perfect liberty which is bounded only by the equal liberty of every other, must civilization advance. Just as they fail in this, must advancing civilization come to a halt and recede. Political economy and social science cannot teach any lessons that are not embraced in the simple truths that were taught to poor fishermen and Jewish peasants by one who eighteen hundred years ago was crucified, the simple truths which, beneath the warpings of selfishness and the distortions of superstition, seem to underlie every religion that has ever striven to formulate the spiritual yearnings of man. End of Book 10, Chapter 3, Paragraphs 22 to 47 Recording by Tim Makarios idiophilus.wordpress.com Book 10, Chapter 4 of Progress and Poverty by Henry George This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 10, Chapter 4 How Modern Civilization May Decline The conclusion we have thus reached harmonizes completely with our previous conclusions. This consideration of the law of human progress not only brings the politico-economic laws, which in this inquiry we have worked out, within the scope of higher law, perhaps the very highest law our minds can grasp, but it proves that the making of land common property in the way I have proposed would give an enormous impetus to civilization, while the refusal to do so must entail retrogression. A civilization like ours must either advance or go back. It cannot stand still. It is not like those homogeneous civilizations, such as that of the Nile Valley, which moulded men for their places and put them in it like bricks into a pyramid. It much more resembles that civilization whose rise and fall is within historic times, and from which it sprung. There is just now a disposition to scoff at any implication that we are not in all respects progressing, and the spirit of our times is that of the edict which the flattering premier proposed to the Chinese emperor who burnt the ancient books that all who may dare to speak together about the Shi and the Shu be put to death that those who make mention of the past so as to blame the present be put to death along with their relatives. Yet it is evident that there have been times of decline, just as there have been times of advance, and it is further evident that these epochs of decline could not at first have been generally recognized. He would have been a rash man who, when Augustus was changing the Rome of brick to the Rome of marble, when wealth was augmenting and magnificence increasing, when victorious legions were extending the frontier, when manners were becoming more refined, language more polished, and literature rising to higher splendors, he would have been a rash man who then would have said that Rome was entering her decline. Yet such was the case. 
and whoever will look may see that though our civilization is apparently advancing with greater rapidity than ever, the same cause which turned Roman progress into retrogression is operating now. What has destroyed every previous civilization has been the tendency to the unequal distribution of wealth and power. This same tendency, operating with increasing force, is observable in our civilization today, showing itself in every progressive community, and with greater intensity the more progressive the community. Wages and interest tend constantly to fall, rent to rise, the rich to become very much richer, the poor to become more helpless and hopeless, and the middle class to be swept away. I have traced this tendency to its cause. I have shown by what simple means this cause may be removed. I now wish to point out how, if this is not done, progress must turn to decadence, and modern civilization decline to barbarism, as have all previous civilizations. It is worth while to point out how this may occur, as many people, being unable to see how progress may pass into retrogression, conceive such a thing impossible. Gibbon, for instance, thought that modern civilization could never be destroyed because there remained no barbarians to overrun it, and it is a common idea that the invention of printing, by so multiplying books, has prevented the possibility of knowledge ever again being lost. The conditions of social progress, as we have traced the law, are association and equality. The general tendency of modern development, since the time when we can first discern the gleams of civilization in the darkness which followed the fall of the Western Empire, has been toward political and legal equality, to the abolition of slavery, to the abrogation of status, to the sweeping away of hereditary privileges, to the substitution of parliamentary for arbitrary government, to the right of private judgment in matters of religion, to the more equal security in person and property of high and low, weak and strong, to the greater freedom of movement and occupation, of speech and of the press. The history of modern civilization is the history of advances in this direction, of the struggles and triumphs of personal, political and religious freedom and the general law is shown by the fact that just as this tendency has asserted itself, civilization has advanced, while just as it has been repressed or forced back, civilization has been checked. This tendency has reached its full expression in the American Republic, where political and legal rights are absolutely equal, and, owing to the system of rotation in office, even the growth of a bureaucracy is prevented where every religious belief or non-belief stands on the same footing, where every boy may hope to be president, every man has an equal voice in public affairs, and every official is immediately or immediately dependent for the short lease of his place upon a popular vote. This tendency has yet some triumphs to win in England, in extending the suffrage and sweeping away the vestiges of monarchy, aristocracy and prelacy while in such countries as Germany and Russia, where divine right is yet a good deal more than a legal fiction, it has a considerable distance to go. But it is the prevailing tendency, and how soon Europe will be completely republican is only a matter of time, or rather of accident. The United States are therefore in this respect the most advanced of all the great nations, in a direction in which all are advancing, and in the United States we see just how much this tendency to personal and political freedom can of itself accomplish. Now, the first effect of the tendency to political equality was to the more equal distribution of wealth and power. For, while population is comparatively sparse, inequality in the distribution of wealth is principally due to the inequality of personal rights and it is only as material progress goes on that the tendency to inequality involved in the reduction of land to private ownership strongly appears. But it is now manifest that absolute political equality does not in itself prevent the tendency to inequality involved in the private ownership of land, and it is further evident that political equality, coexisting with an increasing tendency to the unequal distribution of wealth, must ultimately beget either the despotism of organized tyranny or the worst despotism of anarchy. 
To turn a republican government into a despotism the basest and most brutal, it is not necessary formally to change its constitution or abandon popular elections. It was centuries after Caesar before the absolute master of the Roman world pretended to rule other than by authority of a senate that trembled before him. But forms are nothing when substance has gone, and the forms of popular government to those from which the substance of freedom may most easily go. Extremes meet, and a government of universal suffrage and theoretical equality may, under conditions which impel the change, most readily become a despotism. For their despotism advances in the name and with the might of the people. The single source of power once secured, everything is secured. There is no unfranchised class to whom appeal may be made, no privileged orders who in defending their own rights may defend those of all. No bulwark remains to stay the flood, no eminence to rise above it. They were belted barons led by a mitred archbishop who curbed the Plantagenet with Magna Carta. It was the middle classes who broke the pride of the Stuarts. But a mere aristocracy of wealth will never struggle while it can hope to bribe a tyrant. And when the disparity of condition increases, so does universal suffrage make it easy to seize the source of power, for the greater is the proportion of power in the hands of those who feel no direct interest in the conduct of government who, tortured by want and imbruted by poverty, are ready to sell their votes to the highest bidder or follow the lead of the most blatant demagogue, or who, made bitter by hardships, may even look upon profligate and tyrannous government with the satisfaction we may imagine the proletarians and slaves of Rome to have felt as they saw a Caligula or a Nero raging among the rich patricians. Given a community with republican institutions in which one class is too rich to be shorn of its luxuries, no matter how public affairs are administered, and another so poor that a few dollars on election day will seem more than any abstract consideration, in which the few roll in wealth and the many seethe with discontent at a condition of things they know not how to remedy, and power must pass into the hands of jobbers who will buy and sell it as the praetorians sold the Roman purple, or into the hands of demagogues who will seize and wield it for a time, only to be displaced by worse demagogues. Where there is anything like an equal distribution of wealth, that is to say, where there is general patriotism, virtue and intelligence, the more democratic the government, the better it will be. But where there is gross inequality in the distribution of wealth, the more democratic the government, the worse it will be. For, while rotten democracy may not in itself be worse than rotten autocracy, its effects upon national character will be worse. To give the suffrage to tramps, to paupers, to men whom the chance to labour is a boon, to men who must beg or steal or starve, is to invoke destruction. To put political power in the hands of men embittered and degraded by poverty is to tie firebrands to foxes and turn them loose amid the standing corn. It is to put out the eyes of a Samson and to twine his arms around the pillars of national life. Even the accidents of hereditary succession or of selection by lot, the plan of some of the ancient republics, may sometimes place the wise and just in power. But in a corrupt democracy the tendency is always to give power to the worst. Honesty and patriotism are weighed, and unscrupulousness commands success. The best gravitate to the bottom, the worst float to the top, and the vile will only be ousted by the viler. While as national character must gradually assimilate to the qualities that win power and consequently respect, that demoralization of opinion goes on which in the long panorama of history we may see over and over again transmuting races of freemen into races of slaves. As in England in the last century, when Parliament was but a close corporation of the aristocracy, a corrupt oligarchy clearly fenced off from the masses may exist without much effect on national character, because in that case power is associated in the popular mind with other things than corruption. But where there are no hereditary distinctions, and men are habitually seen to raise themselves by corrupt qualities,
qualities from the lowest places to wealth and power, tolerance of these qualities finally becomes admiration. A corrupt democratic government must finally corrupt the people, and when a people become corrupt there is no resurrection. The life is gone, only the carcass remains, and it is left but for the plowshares of fate to bury it out of sight. How this transformation of popular government into despotism of the vilest and most degrading kind, which must inevitably result from the unequal distribution of wealth, is not a thing of the far future. It is already begun in the United States, and is rapidly going on under our eyes. That our legislative bodies are steadily deteriorating in standard, that men of the highest ability and character are compelled to eschew politics, and the arts of the jobber count for more than the reputation of the statesman, that voting is done more recklessly and the power of money is increasing, that it is harder to arouse the people to the necessity of reforms and more difficult to carry them out, that political differences are ceasing to be differences of principle and abstract ideas are losing their power, that parties are passing into the control of what in general government would be oligarchies and dictatorships are all evidences of political decline. The type of modern growth is the great city. Here are to be found the greatest wealth and the deepest poverty, and it is here that popular government has most clearly broken down. In all the great American cities there is today as clearly defined a ruling class as in the most aristocratic countries of the world. Its members carry wards in their pockets, make up the slates for nominating conventions, distribute offices as they bargain together, and, though they toil not, neither do they spin, wear the best of raiment and spend money lavishly. They are men of power, whose favour the ambitious must court, and whose vengeance he must avoid. Who are these men? The wise, the good, the learned, men who have earned the confidence of their fellow citizens by the purity of their lives, the splendour of their talents, their probity in public trusts, their deep study of the problems of government? No. They are gamblers, saloon-keepers, pugilists, or worse, who have made a trade of controlling votes and of buying and selling offices and official acts. They stand to the government of these cities as the Praetorian guards did to that of declining Rome. He who would wear the purple, fill the curial chair, or have the fasces carried before him, must go or send his messengers to their camps, give them donatives, and make them promises. It is through these men that the rich corporations and powerful pecuniary interests can pack the Senate and the bench with their creatures. It is these men who make school directors, supervisors, assessors, members of the legislature, congressmen. Why, there are many election districts in the United States in which a George Washington, a Benjamin Franklin, or a Thomas Jefferson could no more go to the lower house of a state legislature than under the Ancien Régime a base-born peasant could become a Marshal of France. Their very character would be an insuperable disqualification. In theory we are intense Democrats. The proposal to sacrifice swine in the temple would hardly have excited greater horror and indignation in Jerusalem of old than would among us that of conferring a distinction of rank upon our most eminent citizen. But is there not growing up among us a class who have all the power without any of the virtues of aristocracy? We have simple citizens who control thousands of miles of railroad, millions of acres of land, the means of livelihood of great numbers of men who name the governors of sovereign states as they name their clerks, choose senators as they choose attorneys, and whose will is as supreme with legislatures as that of a French king sitting in a bed of justice. The undercurrents of the times seem to sweep us back again to the old conditions from which we dreamt we had escaped. The development of the artisan and commercial classes gradually broke down feudalism after it had become so complete that men thought heaven as organized on a feudal basis, and ranked the first and second persons of the trinity as suzerain and tenant-in-chief. But now the development of manufactures and exchange, 
acting in a social organization in which land is made private property threatens to compel every worker to seek a master, as the insecurity which followed the final break-up of the Roman Empire compelled every free man to seek a lord. Nothing seems exempt from this tendency. Industry everywhere tends to assume a form in which one is master and many serve. And when one is master and the others serve, the one will control the others, even in such matters as votes. Just as the English landlord votes his tenants, so does the New England mill-owner vote his operatives. There is no mistaking it. The very foundations of society are being sapped before our eyes, while we ask, how is it possible that such a civilization as this, with its railroads and daily newspapers and electric telegraphs, should ever be destroyed? While literature breathes but the belief that we have been, are, and for the future must be, leaving the savage state further and further behind us, there are indications that we are actually turning back again toward barbarism. Let me illustrate. One of the characteristics of barbarism is the low regard for the rights of person and of property. That the laws of our Anglo-Saxon ancestors imposed as penalty for murder are fine proportion to the rank of the victim, while our law knows no distinction of rank, and protects the lowest from the highest, the poorest from the richest, by the uniform penalty of death, is looked upon as evidence of their barbarism and our civilization. And so, that piracy and robbery and slave-trading and blackmailing were once regarded as legitimate occupations is conclusive proof of the rude state of development from which we have so far progressed. But it is a matter of fact that, in spite of our laws, any one who has money enough and wants to kill another may go into any one of our great centres of population and business, and gratify his desire, and then surrender himself to justice, with the chances as a hundred to one that he will suffer no greater penalty than a temporary imprisonment and the loss of a sum proportioned partly to his own wealth and partly to the wealth and standing of the man he kills. His money will be paid not to the family of the murdered man, who have lost their protector, not to the state which has lost a citizen, but to lawyers who understand how to secure delays, to find witnesses, and get juries to disagree. And so, if a man steal enough, he may be sure that his punishment will practically amount but to the loss of a part of the proceeds of his theft and if he steal enough to get off with a fortune, he will be greeted by his acquaintances as a viking might have been greeted after a successful cruise. Even though he robbed those who trusted him, even though he robbed the widow and the fatherless, he has only to get enough, and he may safely flaunt his wealth in the eyes of day. Now the tendency in this direction is an increasing one. It is shown in greatest force where the inequalities in the distribution of wealth are greatest, and it shows itself as they increase. If it be not a return to barbarism, what is it? The failures of justice to which I have alluded are only illustrative of the increasing debility of our legal machinery in every department. It is becoming common to hear men say that it would be better to revert to first principles and abolish law, for then in self-defence the people would form vigilance committees and take justice into their own hands. Is this indicative of advance or retrogression? All this is a matter of common observation. Though we may not speak it openly, the general faith in republican institutions is, where they have reached their fullest development, narrowing and weakening. It is no longer that confident belief in republicanism as the source of national blessings that it once was. Thoughtful men are beginning to see its dangers, without seeing how to escape them, are beginning to accept the view of Macaulay and distrust that of Jefferson. Footnote. See Macaulay's letter to Randall, the biographer of Jefferson. End of footnote. And the people at large are becoming used to the growing corruption. The most ominous political sign in the United States today is the growth of a sentiment which either doubts the existence of an honest man in public office, or looks on him as a fool for not seizing his opportunities. That is to say, the people themselves are becoming corrupted. 
Thus in the United States today is Republican government running the course it must inevitably follow under conditions which cause the unequal distribution of wealth. Where that course leads is clear to whoever will think. As corruption becomes chronic, as public spirit is lost, as traditions of honor, virtue, and patriotism are weakened, as law is brought into contempt and reforms become hopeless, then in the festering mass will be generated volcanic forces, which shatter and rend when seeming accident gives them vent. Strong, unscrupulous men, rising up upon occasion, will become the exponents of blind popular desires or fierce popular passions, and dash aside forms that have lost their vitality. The sword will again be mightier than the pen, and in carnivals of destruction brute force and wild frenzy will alternate with the lethargy of declining civilization. I speak of the United States only because the United States is the most advanced of all the great nations. What shall we say of Europe, where dams of ancient law and custom pen up the swelling waters and standing armies weigh down the safety valves, though year by year the fires grow hotter underneath? Europe tends to republicanism under conditions that will not admit of true republicanism under conditions that substitute for the calm and august figure of liberty the petroleurs and the guillotine. Whence shall come the new barbarians? Go through the squalid quarters of great cities, and you may see, even now, their gathering hordes. How shall learning perish? Men will cease to read, and books will kindle fires and be turned into cartridges. It is startling to think how slight the traces that would be left of our civilization did it pass through the throes which have accompanied the decline of every previous civilization. Paper will not last like parchment, nor are our most massive buildings and monuments to be compared in solidity with the rock-hewn temples and titanic edifices of the old civilizations. Footnote. It is also, it seems to me, instructive to note how inadequate and utterly misleading would be the idea of our civilization which could be gained from the religious and funereal monuments of our time, which are all we have from which to gain our ideas of the buried civilizations. End of footnote. And invention has given us not merely the steam engine and the printing press, but petroleum, nitroglycerine, and dynamite. Yet to hint today that our civilization may possibly be tending to decline seems like the wildness of pessimism. The special tendencies to which I have alluded are obvious to thinking men, but with the majority of thinking men, as with the great masses, the belief in substantial progress is yet deep and strong, a fundamental belief which admits not the shadow of a doubt. But any one who will think over the matter will see that this must necessarily be the case where advance gradually passes into retrogression. For in social development, as in everything else, motion tends to persist in straight lines, and therefore, where there has been a previous advance, it is extremely difficult to recognize decline, even when it has fully commenced. There is an almost irresistible tendency to believe that the forward movement which has been advance, and is still going on, is still advance. The web of beliefs, customs, laws, institutions, and habits of thought, which each community is constantly spinning, and which produces in the individual environed by it all the differences of national character, is never unravelled. That is to say, in the decline of civilization, communities do not go down by the same paths that they came up. For instance, the decline of civilization as manifested in government would not take us back from republicanism to constitutional monarchy and thence to the feudal system. It would take us to imperatorship and anarchy. As manifested in religion, it would not take us back into the faiths of our forefathers, into Protestantism or Catholicity, but into new forms of superstition, of which possibly Mormonism and other even grosser isms may give some vague idea. As manifested in knowledge, it would not take us toward Bacon, but toward the literati of China. And how the retrogression of civilization, following a period of advance, may be so gradual as to attract no attention at the time, 
nay how that decline must necessarily by the great majority of men be mistaken for advance is easily seen for instance there is an enormous difference between grecian art of the classic period and that of the lower empire yet the change was accompanied or rather caused by a change of taste the artists who most quickly followed this change of taste were in their day regarded as the superior artists and so of literature as it became more vapid puerile and stilted it would be in obedience to an altered taste which would regard its increasing weakness as increasing strength and beauty the really good writer would not find readers he would be regarded as rude dry or dull and so would the drama decline not because there was a lack of good plays but because the prevailing taste became more and more that of a less cultured class who of course regard that which they most admire as the best of its kind and so too of religion the superstitions which a superstitious people will add to it will be regarded by them as improvements while as the decline goes on the return to barbarism where it is not in itself regarded as an advance will seem necessary to meet the exigencies of the times for instance flogging as a punishment for certain offences has been recently restored to the penal code of england and has been strongly advocated on this side of the atlantic i express no opinion as to whether this is or is not a better punishment for crime than imprisonment i only point to the fact as illustrating how an increasing amount of crime and an increasing embarrassment as to the maintenance of prisoners both obvious tendencies at present might lead to a fuller return to the physical cruelty of barbarous codes the use of torture in judicial investigations which steadily grew with the decline of roman civilization it is thus easy to see might as manners brutalized and crime increased be demanded as a necessary improvement of the criminal law whether in the present drifts of opinion and taste there are as yet any indications of retrogression it is not necessary to inquire but there are many things about which there can be no dispute which go to show that our civilization has reached a critical period and that unless a new start is made in the direction of social equality the nineteenth century may to the future mark its climax these industrial depressions which cause as much waste and suffering as famines or wars are like the twinges and shocks which precede paralysis everywhere it is evident that the tendency to inequality which is the necessary result of material progress where land is monopolized cannot go much further without carrying our civilization into that downward path which is so easy to enter and so hard to abandon everywhere the increasing intensity of the struggle to live the increasing necessity for straining every nerve to prevent being thrown down and trodden underfoot in the scramble for wealth is draining the forces which gain and maintain improvement in every civilized country pauperism crime insanity and suicides are increasing in every civilized country the diseases are increasing which come from overstrained nerves from insufficient nourishment from squalid lodgings from unwholesome and monotonous occupations from premature labor of children from the tasks and crimes which poverty imposes upon women in every highly civilized country the expectation of life which gradually rose for several centuries and which seems to have culminated about the first quarter of this century appears to be now diminishing footnote statistics which show these things are collected in convenient form in a volume entitled deterioration and race education by samuel royce which has been largely distributed by the venerable peter cooper of new york strangely enough the only remedy proposed by mr royce is the establishment of kindergarten schools End of footnote. it is not an advancing civilization that such figures show it is a civilization which in its undercurrents has already begun to recede when the tide turns in bay or river from flood to ebb it is not all at once but here it still runs on though there it has begun to recede when the sun passes the meridian it can be told only by the way the short shadows fall for the heat of the day yet increases but as sure as the turning tide must soon run full ebb 
as sure as the declining sun must bring darkness, so sure is it that though knowledge yet increases and invention marches on, and new states are being settled, and cities still expand, yet civilization has begun to wane when, in proportion to population, we must build more and more prisons, more and more almshouses, more and more insane asylums. It is not from top to bottom that societies die, it is from bottom to top. But there are evidences far more palpable than any that can be given by statistics, of tendencies to the ebb of civilization. There is a vague but general feeling of disappointment, an increased bitterness among the working classes, a widespread feeling of unrest and brooding revolution. If this were accompanied by a definite idea of how relief is to be obtained, it would be a hopeful sign, but it is not. Though the schoolmaster has been abroad some time, the general power of tracing effect to cause does not seem a whit improved. The reaction toward protectionism, as the reaction toward other exploded fallacies of government, shows this. Footnote. In point of constructive statesmanship, the recognition of fundamental principles and the adaptation of means to ends, the Constitution of the United States, adopted a century ago, is greatly superior to the latest state constitutions, the most recent of which is that of California, a piece of utter botchwork. End of footnote. And even the philosophic freethinker cannot look upon that vast change in religious ideas that is now sweeping over the civilized world without feeling that this tremendous fact may have most momentous relations, which only the future can develop. For what is going on is not a change in the form of religion, but the negation and destruction of the ideas from which religion springs. Christianity is not simply clearing itself of superstitions, but in the popular mind it is dying at the root, as the old paganisms were dying when Christianity entered the world. And nothing arises to take its place. The fundamental ideas of an intelligent creator and of a future life are in the general mind rapidly weakening. Now, whether this may or may not be in itself an advance, the importance of the part which religion has played in the world's history shows the importance of the change that is now going on. Unless human nature has suddenly altered in what the universal history of the race shows to be its deepest characteristics, the mightiest actions and reactions are thus preparing. Such stages of thought have heretofore always marked periods of transition. On a smaller scale and to a less depth, for I think anyone who will notice the drift of our literature and talk upon such subjects with the men he meets, we'll see that it is subsoil and not surface ploughing that materialistic ideas are now doing. Such a state of thought preceded the French Revolution. But the closest parallel to the wreck of religious ideas now going on is to be found in that period in which ancient civilization began to pass from splendour to decline. What change may come, no mortal man can tell, but that some great change must come, thoughtful men begin to feel. The civilized world is trembling on the verge of a great movement. Either it must be a leap upward, which will open the way to advances yet undreamt of, or it must be a plunge downward, which will carry us back toward barbarism. End of Book 10, Chapter 4 Recording by Tim Makarios idiophilus.wordpress.com Book 10, Chapter 5 of Progress and Poverty by Henry George. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 10, Chapter 5 The Central Truth. In the short space to which this latter part of our inquiry is necessarily confined, I have been obliged to omit much that I would like to say, and to touch briefly where an exhaustive consideration would not be out of place. Nevertheless, this at least is evident, that the truth to which we were led in the politico-economic branch of our inquiry is as clearly apparent in the rise and fall of nations and the growth and decay of civilizations 
and that it accords with those deep-seated recognitions of relation and sequence that we denominate moral perceptions. Thus have been given to our conclusions the greatest certitude and highest sanction. This truth involves both a menace and a promise. It shows that the evils arising from the unjust and unequal distribution of wealth, which are becoming more and more apparent as modern civilization goes on, are not incidents of progress, but tendencies which must bring progress to a halt, that they will not cure themselves, but, on the contrary, must, unless their cause is removed, grow greater and greater until they sweep us back into barbarism by the road every previous civilization has trod but it also shows that these evils are not imposed by natural laws, that they spring solely from social maladjustments which ignore natural laws, and that in removing their cause we shall be giving an enormous impetus to progress. The poverty which in the midst of abundance pinches and imbrutes men, and all the manifold evils which flow from it, spring from a denial of justice. In permitting the monopolization of the opportunities which nature freely offers to all, we have ignored the fundamental law of justice. For, so far as we can see, when we view things upon a large scale, justice seems to be the supreme law of the universe. But by sweeping away this injustice and asserting the rights of all men to natural opportunities, we shall conform ourselves to the law. We shall remove the great cause of unnatural inequality in the distribution of wealth and power. We shall abolish poverty, tame the ruthless passions of greed, dry up the springs of vice and misery, light in dark places the lamp of knowledge, give new vigour to invention and a fresh impulse to discovery, substitute political strength for political weakness, and make tyranny and anarchy impossible. The reform I have proposed accords with all that is politically, socially, or morally desirable. It has the qualities of a true reform, for it will make all other reforms easier. What is it but the carrying out in letter and spirit of the truth enunciated in the Declaration of Independence, the self-evident truth that is the heart and soul of the Declaration, that all men are created equal? that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These rights are denied when the equal right to land, on which and by which men alone can live, is denied. Equality of political rights will not compensate for the denial of the equal right to the bounty of nature. Political liberty, when the equal right to land is denied, becomes, as population increases and invention goes on, merely the liberty to compete for employment at starvation wages. This is the truth we have ignored, and so there come beggars in our streets and tramps on our roads, and poverty enslaves men who we boast are political sovereigns, and want breeds ignorance that our schools cannot enlighten and citizens vote as their masters dictate, and the demagogue usurps the part of the statesman, and gold weighs in the scales of justice, and in high places sit those who do not pay to civic virtue even the compliment of hypocrisy, and the pillars of the republic that we thought so strong already bend under an increasing strain. We honour liberty in name and in form, we set up her statutes and sound her praises, but we have not fully trusted her, and with our growth so grow her demands. She will have no half-service. Liberty, it is a word to conjure with, not to vex the ear in empty boastings. For liberty means justice, and justice is the natural law, the law of health and symmetry and strength, of fraternity and cooperation. They who look upon liberty as having accomplished her mission when she has abolished hereditary privileges and given men the ballot, who think of her as having no further relations to the everyday affairs of life, have not seen her real grandeur. To them the poets who have sung of her must seem rhapsodists and her martyrs fools. As the sun is the lord of life as well as of light, as his beams not merely pierce the clouds, but support all growth, supply all motion, and call forth from what would otherwise be a cold and inert mass all the infinite diversities of being and beauty, so is liberty to mankind. 
It is not for an abstraction that men have toiled and died, that in every age the witnesses of liberty have stood forth and the martyrs of liberty have suffered. We speak of liberty as one thing, and of virtue, wealth, knowledge, invention, national strength, and national independence as other things. But of all these, liberty is the source, the mother, the necessary condition. She is to virtue what light is to color, to wealth what sunshine is to grain, to knowledge what eyes are to sight. She is the genius of invention, the brawn of national strength, the spirit of national independence. Where liberty rises, there virtue grows, wealth increases, knowledge expands, invention multiplies human powers, and in strength and spirit the freer nation rises among her neighbors as Saul amid his brethren, taller and fairer. Where liberty sinks, there virtue fades, wealth diminishes, knowledge is forgotten, invention ceases, and empires once mighty in arms and arts become a helpless prey to freer barbarians. Only in broken gleams and partial light has the sun of liberty yet beamed among men, but all progress hath she called forth. Liberty came to a race of slaves crouching under Egyptian whips, and led them forth from the house of bondage. She hardened them in the desert, and made of them a race of conquerors. The free spirit of the Mosaic law took their thinkers up to heights where they beheld the unity of God, and inspired their poets with strains that yet phrase the highest exaltations of thought. Liberty dawned on the Phoenician coast, and ships passed the pillars of Hercules to plough the unknown sea. She shed a partial light on Greece, and marble grew to shapes of ideal beauty. Words became the instruments of subtlest thought, and against the scanty militia of free cities the countless hosts of the great king broke like surges against a rock. She cast her beams on the four-acre farms of Italian husbandmen, and born of her strength the power came forth that conquered the world. They glinted from shields of German warriors, and Augustus wept his legions. Out of the night that followed her eclipse, her slanting rays fell again on free cities, and a lost learning revived, modern civilization began, a new world was unveiled. And as liberty grew, so grew art, wealth, power, knowledge, and refinement. In the history of every nation we may read the same truth. It was the strength born of Magna Carta that won Crecy and Agincourt. It was the revival of liberty from the despotism of the Tudors that glorified the Elizabethan age. It was the spirit that brought a crowned tyrant to the block that planted here the seed of a mighty tree. It was the energy of an ancient freedom that, the moment it had gained unity, made Spain the mightiest power of the world, only to fall to the lowest depth of weakness when tyranny succeeded liberty. See in France all intellectual vigour dying under the tyranny of the seventeenth century to revive in splendour as liberty awoke in the eighteenth, and on the enfranchisement of French peasants in the great revolution basing the wonderful strength that has in our time defied defeat. Shall we not trust her? In our time, as in times before, creep on the insidious forces that, producing inequality, destroy liberty. On the horizon the clouds begin to lower. Liberty calls to us again. We must follow her further. We must trust her fully. Either we must wholly accept her or she will not stay. It is not enough that men should vote. It is not enough that they should be theoretically equal before the law. They must have liberty to avail themselves of the opportunities and means of life. They must stand on equal terms with reference to the bounty of nature. Either this, or liberty withdraws her light. Either this, or darkness comes on, and the very forces that progress has evolved turn to powers that work destruction. This is the universal law. This is the lesson of the centuries. Unless its foundations be laid in justice, the social structure cannot stand. Our primary social adjustment is a denial of justice. In allowing one man to own the land on which and from which other men must live, we have made them his bondsmen in a degree which increases as material progress goes on. This is the subtle alchemy that in ways they do not realize is extracting from the masses in every civilized country the fruits of their weary toil.
that is instituting a harder and more hopeless slavery in place of that which has been destroyed, that is bringing political despotism out of political freedom, and must soon transmute democratic institutions into anarchy. It is this that turns the blessings of material progress into a curse. It is this that crowds human beings into noisome cellars and squalid tenement houses, that fills prisons and brothels, that goads men with want and consumes them with greed, that robs women of the grace and beauty of perfect womanhood, that takes from little children the joy and innocence of life's morning. Civilizations so based cannot continue. The eternal laws of the universe forbid it. Ruins of dead empires testify, and the witness that is in every soul answers, that it cannot be. It is something grander than benevolence, something more august than charity. It is justice herself that demands of us to right this wrong. Justice that will not be denied, that cannot be put off. Justice that with the scales carries the sword. Shall we ward the stroke with liturgies and prayers? Shall we avert the decrees of immutable law by raising churches when hungry infants moan and weary mothers weep? Though it may take the language of prayer, it is blasphemy that attributes to the inscrutable decrees of providence the suffering and brutishness that come of poverty, that turns with folded hands to the All-Father and lays on him the responsibility for the want and crime of our great cities. We degrade the everlasting, we slander the just one. A merciful man would have better ordered the world. A just man would crush with his foot such an ulcerous anthill. It is not the Almighty, but we who are responsible for the vice and misery that fester amid our civilization. The Creator showers upon us his gifts, more than enough for all. But like swine scrambling for food, we tread them in the mire, tread them in the mire, while we tear and rend each other. In the very centres of our civilization today are want and suffering enough to make sick at heart whoever does not close his eyes and steal his nerves. Dare we turn to the Creator and ask Him to relieve it? Supposing the prayer were heard, and at the behest with which the universe sprang into being there should glow in the sun a greater power, new virtue fill the air, fresh vigour the soil, that for every blade of grass that now grows two should spring up and the seed that now increases fiftyfold should increase a hundredfold. Would poverty be abated or want relieved? Manifestly no. Whatever benefit would accrue would be but temporary. The new powers streaming through the material universe could be utilized only through land, and land being private property, the classes that now monopolize the bounty of the Creator would monopolize all the new bounty. Landowners would alone be benefited. Rents would increase, but wages would still tend to the starvation point. This is not merely a deduction of political economy. It is a fact of experience. We know it because we have seen it. Within our own times, under our very eyes, that power which is above all and in all and through all, that power of which the whole universe is but the manifestation, that power which maketh all things, and without which is not anything made that is made, has increased the bounty which men may enjoy, as truly as though the fertility of nature had been increased. Into the mind of one came the thought that harnessed steam for the service of mankind. To the inner ear of another was whispered the secret that compels the lightning to bear a message round the globe. In every direction have the laws of matter been revealed. In every department of industry have arisen arms of iron and fingers of steel, whose effect upon the production of wealth has been precisely the same as an increase in the fertility of nature. What has been the result? Simply that landowners get all the gain. The wonderful discoveries and inventions of our century have neither increased wages nor lightened toil. The effect has simply been to make the few richer, the many more helpless. Can it be that the gifts of the Creator may be thus misappropriated with impunity? Is it a light thing that labor should be robbed of its earnings while greed rolls in wealth, that the many should want while the few are surfeited? Turn to history, and on every page may be read the lesson that such wrong never goes unpunished, that the nemesis that follows injustice never falters nor sleeps. 
Look around today. Can this state of things continue? May we even say, after us the deluge? Nay, the pillars of the state are trembling even now, and the very foundations of society begin to quiver with pent-up forces that glow underneath. The struggle that must either revivify or convulse in ruin is near at hand, if it be not already begun. The fiat has gone forth. With steam and electricity and the new powers born of progress, forces have entered the world that will either compel us to a higher plane or overwhelm us as nation after nation, as civilization after civilization, have been overwhelmed before. It is the delusion which precedes destruction that sees in the popular unrest with which the civilized world is feverishly pulsing only the passing effect of ephemeral causes. Between democratic ideas and the aristocratic adjustments of society there is an irreconcilable conflict. Here in the United States, as there in Europe, it may be seen arising. We cannot go on permitting men to vote and forcing them to tramp. We cannot go on educating boys and girls in our public schools and then refusing them the right to earn an honest living. We cannot go on prating of the inalienable rights of man and then denying the inalienable right to the bounty of the Creator. Even now, in old bottles, the new wine begins to ferment, and elemental forces gather for the strife. But if, while there is yet time, we turn to justice and obey her, if we trust liberty and follow her, the dangers that now threaten must disappear, the forces that now menace will turn to agencies of elevation. Think of the powers now wasted, of the infinite fields of knowledge yet to be explored, of the possibilities of which the wondrous inventions of this century give us but a hint. With want destroyed, with greed changed to noble passions, with the fraternity that is born of equality taking the place of the jealousy and fear that now array men against each other, with mental power loosed by conditions that give to the humblest comfort and leisure, and who shall measure the heights to which our civilization may soar? Words fail the thought. It is the golden age of which poets have sung and high-raised seers have told in metaphor. It is the glorious vision which has always haunted man with gleams of fitful splendor. It is what he saw whose eyes at Patmos were closed in a trance. It is the culmination of Christianity, the city of God on earth, with its walls of jasper and its gates of pearl. It is the reign of the Prince of Peace. End of Book 10, Chapter 5 Recording by Tim Macarios idiophilus.wordpress.com Conclusion of Progress and Poverty by Henry George This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Conclusion The Problem of Individual Life the days of the nations bear no trace of all the sunshine so far foretold. The cannon speaks in the teacher's place. The age is weary with work and gold, and high hopes wither and memories wane. On hearths and altars the fires are dead. But that brave faith hath not lived in vain, and this is all that our watcher said. Francis Brown My task is done. Yet the thought still mounts. The problems we have been considering lead into a problem higher and deeper still. Behind the problems of social life lies the problem of individual life. I have found it impossible to think of the one without thinking of the other, and so I imagine will it be with those who, reading this book, go with me in thought. For, as says Guizot, when the history of civilization is completed, when there is nothing more to say as to our present existence, man inevitably asks himself whether all is exhausted, whether he has reached the end of all things. This problem I cannot now discuss. I speak of it only because the thought which, while writing this book, has come with inexpressible cheer to me, may also be of cheer to some who read it. For, whatever be its fate, it will be read by some who in their heart of hearts have taken the cross of a new crusade. This thought will come to them without my suggestion. 
but we are surer that we see a star when we know that others also see it. The truth that I have tried to make clear will not find easy acceptance. If that could be, it would have been accepted long ago. If that could be, it would never have been obscured. But it will find friends, those who will toil for it, suffer for it, if need be die for it. This is the power of truth. Will it at length prevail? Ultimately, yes. But in our own times, or in times of which any memory of us remains, who shall say? For the man who, seeing the want and misery, the ignorance and brutishness caused by unjust social institutions, sets himself, in so far as he has strength, to right them, there is disappointment and bitterness. So it has been of old time. So it is even now. But the bitterest thought, and it sometimes comes to the best and bravest, is that of the hopelessness of the effort, the futility of the sacrifice. To how few of those who sow the seed is it given to see it grow, or even with certainty to know that it will grow? Let us not disguise it. Over and over again has the standard of truth and justice been raised in this world. Over and over again has it been trampled down, oftentimes in blood. If they are weak forces that are opposed to truth, how should error so long prevail? If justice has but to raise her head to have injustice flee before her, how should the wail of the oppressed so long go up? But for those who see truth and would follow her, for those who recognize justice and would stand for her, success is not the only thing. Success! Why, falsehood has often that to give, and injustice often has that to give. Must not truth and justice have something to give that is their own by proper right, theirs in essence and not by accident? That they have, and that here and now, every one who has felt their exaltation knows. But sometimes the clouds sweep down. It is sad, sad reading the lives of men who would have done something for their fellows. To Socrates they gave the hemlock, Gracchus they killed with sticks and stones, and one, greatest and purest of all, they crucified. These seem but types. Today Russian prisons are full, and in long processions men and women who, but for high-minded patriotism, might have lived in ease and luxury, move in chains towards the death in life of Siberia. And in penury and want, in neglect and contempt, destitute even of the sympathy that would have been so sweet, how many in every country have closed their eyes? This we see. But do we see it all? In writing I have picked up a newspaper. In it is a short account, evidently translated from a semi-official report, of the execution of three nihilists at Kiev. The Prussian subject Brentner, the unknown man calling himself Antonov, and the nobleman Osinsky. At the foot of the gallows they were permitted to kiss one another. Then the hangman cut the rope, the surgeons pronounced the victims dead, the bodies were buried at the foot of the scaffold, and the nihilists were given up to eternal oblivion. Thus says the account. I do not believe it. No, not to oblivion. I have in this inquiry followed the course of my own thought. When in mind I set out on it, I had no theory to support, no conclusions to prove. Only when I first realized the squalid misery of a great city, it appalled and tormented me, and would not let me rest, for thinking of what caused it and how it could be cured. But out of this inquiry has come to me something I did not think to find, and a faith that was dead revives. The yearning for a further life is natural and deep. It grows with intellectual growth, and perhaps none really feel it more than those who have begun to see how great is the universe, and how infinite are the vistas which every advance in knowledge opens before us, vistas which would require nothing short of eternity to explore. But in the mental atmosphere of our times, to the great majority of men on whom mere creeds have lost their hold, it seems impossible to look on this yearning save as a vain and childish hope. 
arising from man's egotism, and for which there is not the slightest ground or warrant, but which, on the contrary, seems inconsistent with positive knowledge. Now, when we come to analyze and trace up the ideas that thus destroy the hope of a future life, we shall find them, I think, to have their source, not in any revelations of physical science, but in certain teachings of political and social science which have deeply permeated thought in all directions. They have their root in the doctrines that there is a tendency to the production of more human beings than can be provided for that vice and misery are the result of natural laws and the means by which advance goes on and that human progress is by a slow race development these doctrines which have been generally accepted as a proved truth do what except as scientific interpretations have been coloured by them the extensions of physical science do not do they reduce the individual to insignificance. They destroy the idea that there can be in the ordering of the universe any regard for his existence, or any recognition of what we call moral qualities. It is difficult to reconcile the idea of human immortality with the idea that nature wastes men by constantly bringing them into being where there is no room for them. It is impossible to reconcile the idea of an intelligent and beneficent creator with the belief that the wretchedness and degradation which are the lot of such a large proportion of humankind result from his enactments, while the idea that man mentally and physically is the result of slow modifications perpetuated by heredity irresistibly suggests the idea that it is the race life, not the individual life, which is the object of human existence. Thus has vanished with many of us, and is still vanishing with more of us, that belief which in the battles and ills of life affords the strongest support and deepest consolation. Now, in the inquiry through which we have passed, we have met these doctrines and seen their fallacy. We have seen that population does not tend to outrun subsistence. We have seen that the waste of human powers and the prodigality of human suffering do not spring from natural laws, but from the ignorance and selfishness of men in refusing to conform to natural laws. We have seen that human progress is not by altering the nature of men, but that, on the contrary, the nature of men seems, generally speaking, always the same. Thus the nightmare which is banishing from the modern world the belief in a future life is destroyed. Not that all difficulties are removed, for turn which way we may, we come to what we cannot comprehend, but that difficulties are removed which seem conclusive and insuperable, and thus hope springs up. But this is not all. Political economy has been called the dismal science, and as currently taught, is hopeless and despairing. But this, as we have seen, is solely because she has been degraded and shackled, her truths dislocated, her harmonies ignored. The word she would utter gagged in her mouth, and her protest against wrong turned into an endorsement of injustice. Freed, as I have tried to free her, in her own proper symmetry, political economy is radiant with hope. For properly understood, the laws which govern the production and distribution of wealth show that the want and injustice of the present social state are not necessary, but that, on the contrary, a social state is possible in which poverty would be unknown, and all the better qualities and higher powers of human nature would have opportunity for full development. And, further than this, when we see that societal development is governed neither by a special providence nor by a merciless fate, but by law, at once unchangeable and beneficent. When we see that human will is the great factor, and that taking men in the aggregate, their condition is as they make it. When we see that economic law and moral law are essentially one, and that the truth which the intellect grasps after toilsome effort is but that which the moral sense reaches by a quick intuition, a flood of light breaks in upon the problem of individual life. These countless millions like ourselves, who on this earth of ours have passed and still are passing, with their joys and sorrows, their toil and their striving, their aspirations and their fears, their strong perceptions of things deeper than sense, their common feelings which form the basis even of the most divergent creeds, their little lives do not seem so much like meaningless waste. 
The great fact which science in all her branches shows is the universality of law. Wherever he can trace it, whether in the fall of an apple or in the revolution of binary suns, the astronomer sees the working of the same law, which operates in the minutest divisions in which we may distinguish space, as it does in the immeasurable distances with which his science deals. Out of that which lies beyond his telescope comes a moving body, and again it disappears. So far as he can trace its course, the law is ignored. Does he say that this is an exception? On the contrary, he says that this is merely a part of its orbit that he has seen, that beyond the reach of his telescope the law holds good. He makes his calculations, and after centuries they are proved. Now, if we trace out the laws which govern human life and society, we find that in the largest as in the smallest community they are the same. We find that what seem at first sight like divergences and exceptions are but manifestations of the same principles. And we find that everywhere we can trace it, the social law runs into and conforms with the moral law, that in the life of a community, justice infallibly brings its reward and injustice its punishment. But this we cannot see in individual life. If we look merely at individual life, we cannot see that the laws of the universe have the slightest relation to good or bad, to right or wrong, to just or unjust. Footnote. Let us not delude our children. If for no other reason than for that which Plato gives, that when they come to discard that which we told them as pious fable, they will also discard that which we told them as truth. The virtues which relate to self do generally bring their reward. Either a merchant or a thief will be more successful if he be sober, prudent, and faithful to his promises. But as to the virtues which do not relate to self, it seems a story from the world of spirits when any one obtains that which he merits, or any merits that which he obtains. End of footnote. Shall we then say that the law which is manifest in social life is not true of individual life? It is not scientific to say so. We would not say so in reference to anything else. Shall we not rather say this simply proves that we do not see the whole of individual life? The laws which political economy discovers, like the facts and relations of physical nature, harmonize with what seems to be the law of mental development not a necessary and involuntary progress, but a progress in which the human will is an initiatory force. But in life, as we are cognizant of it, mental development can go but a little way. The mind hardly begins to awake ere the body powers decline. It but becomes dimly conscious of the vast fields before it, but begins to learn and use its strength, to recognize relations and extend its sympathies, when, with the death of the body, it passes away. Unless there is something more, there seems here a break, a failure. Whether it be a Humboldt or a Herschel, a Moses who looks from Pisgah, a Joshua who leads the host, or one of those sweet and patient souls who in narrow circles live radiant lives, there seems, if mind and character here developed can go no further, a purposelessness inconsistent with what we can see of the linked sequence of the universe. By a fundamental law of our minds, the law, in fact, upon which political economy relies in all her deductions, we cannot conceive of a means without an end, a contrivance without an object. Now, to all nature, so far as we come in contact with it in this world, the support and employment of the intelligence that is in man furnishes such an end and object. But unless man himself may rise to or bring forth something higher, his existence is unintelligible. So strong is this metaphysical necessity that those who deny to the individual anything more than this life are compelled to transfer the idea of perfectibility to the race. But as we have seen, and the argument could have been made much more complete, there is nothing whatever to show any essential race improvement. Human progress is not the improvement of human nature. The advances in which civilization consists are not secured in the constitution of man, but in the constitution of society. They are thus not fixed and permanent, but may at any time be lost, 
nay, are constantly tending to be lost. And further than this, if human life does not continue beyond what we see of it here, then we are confronted, with regard to the race, with the same difficulty as with the individual. For it is as certain that the race must die as it is that the individual must die. We know there have been geologic conditions under which human life was impossible on this earth. We know that they must return again. Even now, as the earth circles on her appointed orbit, the northern ice cap slowly thickens, and the time gradually approaches when its glaciers will flow again, and austral seas, sweeping northward, bury the seats of present civilization under ocean wastes, as it may be they now bury what was once as high a civilization as our own. And beyond these periods science discerns a dead earth, an exhausted sun, a time when, clashing together, the solar system shall resolve itself into a gaseous form, again to begin immeasurable mutations. What then is the meaning of life, of life absolutely and inevitably bounded by death? To me it seems intelligible only as the avenue and vestibule to another life. And its facts seem explainable only upon a theory which cannot be expressed but in myth and symbol, and which, everywhere and at all times, the myths and symbols in which men have tried to portray their deepest perceptions do in some form express. The scriptures of the men who have been and gone, the Bibles, the Zendavestas, the Vedas, the Dhammapadas, and the Qurans, the esoteric doctrines of old philosophies, the inner meaning of grotesque religions, the dogmatic constitutions of ecumenical councils, the preachings of foxes and wesleys and savonarolas, the traditions of red Indians and beliefs of black savages have a heart and core in which they agree, a something which seems like the variously distorted apprehensions of a primary truth. And out of the chain of thought we have been following there seems vaguely to rise a glimpse of what they vaguely saw, a shadowy gleam of ultimate relations, the endeavour to express which inevitably falls into type and allegory. A garden in which are set the trees of good and evil, a vineyard in which there is the master's work to do, a passage from life behind to life beyond, a trial and a struggle of which we cannot see the end. Look around today. Lo, here, now, in our civilized society, the old allegories yet have a meaning, the old myths are still true. Into the valley of the shadow of death yet often leads the path of duty, through the streets of vanity fair walk Christian and faithful, and on great heart's armor ring the clanging blows. Ormuzd still fights with Ahriman, the prince of light with the powers of darkness. He who will hear, to him the clarions of the battle call. How they call and call and call, till the heart swells that hears them. Strong soul and high endeavour, the world needs them now. Beauty still lies imprisoned, and iron wheels go over the good and true and beautiful that might spring from human lives. And they who fight with Ormuzd, though they may not know each other, somewhere sometime will the muster roll be called. Though truth and right seem often overborne, we may not see it all. How can we see it all? All that is passing, even here, we cannot tell. The vibrations of matter which give the sensations of light and colour become to us indistinguishable when they pass a certain point. It is only within a like range that we have cognizance of sounds. Even animals have senses which we have not. And here? Compared with the solar system, our earth is but an indistinguishable speck, and the solar system itself shrivels into nothingness when gauged with the star depths. Shall we say that what passes from our sight passes into oblivion? No, not into oblivion. Far, far beyond our ken the eternal laws must hold their sway. The hope that rises is the heart of all religions. The poets have sung it, the seers have told it, and in its deepest pulses the heart of man throbs responsive to its truth. 
This that Plutarch said is what in all times and in all tongues has been said by the pure-hearted and strong-sighted, who, standing as it were on the mountain-tops of thought and looking over the shadowy ocean, have beheld the loom of land. Men's souls, encompassed here with bodies and passions, have no communication with God except what they can reach to in conception only, by means of philosophy, as by a kind of an obscure dream. But when they are loosed from the body, and removed into the unseen, invisible, impassable, and pure region, this God is then their leader and king. They there, as it were, hanging on him wholly, and beholding without weariness, and passionately affecting that beauty which cannot be expressed or uttered by men. End of Conclusion Recording by Tim Macarios idiophilus.wordpress.com End of Progress and Poverty by Henry George